ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming today. We, I just have the honor to open the first ever Asia Communication Summit organized by the World Communications Forum in Davos, Switzerland. Uh, about 14 years ago, when we were starting the World Communications Forum in the beautiful mountain resort of Davos, immediately after the World Economic Forum, we even did not expect that our project will have such a great success and will gather so many people from all over the world. On that stage, we have members for, from more than 45 countries. And uh, thanks to our dear friend, Mina Nazari from Iran, with her coordination and with the help of our friends from India, Vietnam, and many other countries, uh, we decided to launch the Asia Communication Summit to discuss the typical communications issues, case studies, uh, and different ideas from the beautiful continent of Asia. Let me make you a remark. No, first of all, let me introduce myself. My, I'm Maxim Bekhara. I'm the president of the World Communications Forum uh, since uh, two years. And I, have a, I had the honor to speed up the, the forum together with our assistant, Jessica Kristeva, uh, sitting next to me, uh, and to raise it in an amazing level, in a way that our community these days is one of the most respected globally in the global communications, in the world communications market. So let me make an important remark that in our business, public relations or public communications, we hardly divide the world into continents. The business becomes global more and more, borders are disappearing, the issues almost come to one and the same into different countries or continents. And the reason is only one, the reason is called social media. And social media made us owners of real media made us possible to express our opinions, sometimes on our behalf on our agencies, sometimes on behalf of our clients. And social media turned the world in a way that we do these days completely different business than we did it 10 years ago. I'm sure in Asia is the same. And saying this, let me pay our deep respect to Mina for her tireless job for her efforts and uh, motivation and inspiration to organize this forum. I'm sure that the, our friends and members from the United States will organize very soon a America's Communication Summit. Our friends from Africa will do the same in their continent. But uh, more, we should be aware that Asia is the first. Again, thank you very much. And saying this, I would like to welcome Mina for her words at the very beginning. And then she will give the floor to the managers of the different topics of our summit. We have today topics like public relations in the digital age, power of social media and its impact on socioeconomic and political sketch of Asia. We will also talk for the next, I guess, two hours about the trust, transparency, and the truth in the public relations business, something which is absolutely crucial for us. Trust, we sell trust, we must be tra transparent, and we tell the audience the truth and nothing else. We will talk about cross-cultural communication in Asia. Are there any barriers? What will be the impact? And at the end of the day, we will have our executive board member, Mai and Lee from Vietnam, who will sum up the most important conclusions from the speakers today. So again, thank you very much. Madame Nazari, you have the floor. Uh, greeting everyone. Uh, can you hear me right now? Is it, everything is okay? Excellent. Oh, thank Excellent. you. Very much. Uh, 
Uh, greeting everyone. Uh, this is Mina Nazari from Iran. I'm WCFA controller and uh, Asia Communication Summit uh, coordinator. Uh, it's my pleasure and my honor to coordinate this first and largest uh, summit. Uh, and it um, wouldn't have been possible without the support of Maxim Bahar. He has supported my ideas plans and projects. Thank you very much, Maxim Bahar. I would like to a special thanks from Maxim Bahar because since I had honor, he has had a great impact on my professional business life. It's really, thank you very much again, Maxim. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much all respected speakers from uh, for the time and efforts uh, put into preparing and executing to speech. Uh, Professor Dr. Yahya, Kamal, uh, Yahya Kamalipur from Iran, on my education in the field of communication. Mr. Nui Khwami from Vietnam, Dr. Hanzade Urelman from Turkey, Professor Dr. Zulhamri Abdullah from Malaysia, Professor Dr. Sayed Abdullah Siraj from Pakistan, Ms. Mani Lamba from India, Ms. Tatevik Simania from Armenia, Takadri from India, Ms. Maria Ashigen, Maria Ashigen from Malaysia, Ms. Paromaroy Chadri from India, Ms. Mai Anli from Vietnam. Really, I appreciate your time. I'm since a part in Asia Communication Summit and uh, my special thanks from my friends in WCFA who don't let me be alone during coordinating. First of all, my dearest Jessica, WCFA Executive Secretary, we really have worked it, uh, about a couple of months for uh, this summit 24 seven, our respected plans moderators, Mr. Saurabh from India, Ganesh from India. And finally, my great appreciation from Dr. Hisham Misba from Egypt, overall moderator. Thank you so much to all participants in Asia Communication Summit. I would like uh, uh, to uh, say that really I'm so happy and stressful holding this summit. Uh, this time, I would like to invite Professor Dr. Hisham Misbah uh, from Egypt, President Arab US Association Communication Educators, Association Professors, Communication Department, Rolling College, and WCFA GAB member to start summit. Please, Dr. ORU, thank you very much to everyone. Thank you, Maxim. Thank you, Mina. Uh, I don't have enough words to thank you for your effort, your inspiration, and your dedication to making this happen. Thank you. Um, I have the honor to be uh, the general moderator of this summit that consists of two panels, and each panel uh, will be uh, preceded by a keynote speaker. We are honored and lucky to have two keynote speakers who are going to uh, usher in each panel individually. So for the first panel, we're gonna start with uh, Professor Kamali Poor, who uh, will talk about um, digital challenges and PR in the digital age. Then the panel will start and the panel will have its own moderator and speakers in the panel will present and then we're gonna have a Q and A session at the end of the panel. Uh, for the second panel, keynote speaker will start, we have uh, Mr. Uh, Duwen Mi from Vietnam, who will uh, speak about trust, transparency, and the truth in PR. 
So without further ado, I will invite Professor Kamalipur to start his speech um, about uh, PR in the digital age. Professor Kamalipur has 20 books plus in global communication, public relations. He is a longstanding professor. He is now at uh, North Carolina State University. Professor Kamalipur, the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, I'm in North Carolina, and the time here is um, 8.15 in the morning. Uh, it's a pleasure to be uh, with you. Again, my congratulations to the organizers of this uh, virtual conference. Um, and Maxim, uh, congratulations on your recent book. And uh, Mina, congratulations on uh, uh, organizing this uh, uh, conference. An impressive group of uh, uh, friends and scholars. Um, so I'm going to uh, uh, briefly share with you uh, some information about the status of public relations in the digital age. Now, when it comes to the history of communication, uh, we, we have had two major revolutions. So there have been many revolutions, uh, but two uh, stand out. And the first was the invention of the Gutenberg uh, printing press. The uh, Gutenberg printing press changed all aspects of human life. And the second revolution was the invention of the internet. Likewise, the internet has revolutionized, has changed all aspects of our lives, regardless of where we are. Now, before the internet, uh, communication was mainly one way and non-interactive. Uh, PR practitioners had to uh, write a uh, news uh, release and mail the news release to, let's say, a newspaper, and uh, then uh, uh, wait for the results. Um, so in, before the internet, uh, communication was mediated by media editors or gatekeepers. Uh, consequently, uh, PR uh, practitioners had to send their uh, stories to the press and had very little control over whether it, it is used or not. Um, after the internet, things changed. Now we have two-way communication and multi-directional communication. Uh, through various digital platforms, uh, blogs, uh, Facebook, um, Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, uh, TikTok, and so on. And um, that's uh, uh, our today's reality. Uh, so today, media companies are distributing news in a synchronized manner via different channels. And what has happened is all the traditional media have converged onto the internet. Um, PR practitioners can now directly communicate and interact with their uh, constituents. That's a, a huge, uh, development. That's extremely important. Uh, you are now in control of your message. Now, the, I want to make a clarification between advertising and public relations. Advertising is paid publicity for products or services. 
public relations is earned or free publicity for a company or organization. So advertising sells a product or service. Uh, PR promotes the overall image of a company or organization and its brand. As we all know, branding is extremely important. And um, it, when it comes to uh, uh, digital public relations, I mean, or, or electronic public relations or EPR, right? That's a, that emerged after the internet, a new branch, a new area of study, a new field called EPR or digital public relations. So uh, EPR or digital PR is interactive, um, multi-platform, multi-linear, and participatory. Uh, audiences, re reactions, feedback are often communicated to the sender immediately. So before the internet, the feedback was delayed. Now it is immediate. Now, when it comes to uh, PR functions, as you know, and I'm going to uh, just state this um, statement or definition by the PRSA uh, that says public relations is a strategic communication process that builds mutually beneficial relationships between organizations and their publics. Now, mutually beneficial. This is a key element because if communication is not mutually beneficial, if the communication or the message benefits only the sender, then that becomes propaganda, not public relations. That's an important distinction. Uh, public relations is about influencing, engaging, and building a relationship with key uh, 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 stakeholders internally and externally. And you're all familiar with the internal publics and external publics. And also according to PRSA, um, PR is a management function. As a management function, public relations includes anticipating, analyzing, and interpreting public opinion, okay? uh, counseling management, uh, developing programs uh, that inform public understanding, and planning, and uh, implementing and organizing uh, uh, events. An important conduct of companies or agencies in is uh, social responsibility. And we often uh, don't think about this important factor. Um, companies and agencies, public or private, governmental or non-governmental, uh, should contribute to the welfare, this is important, contribute to the welfare of society and not always uh, focus on maximizing profit. A prosperous society, a prosperous community uh, benefits any given organization or company. And when we uh, think of the responsibilities or functions of public relations, um, notice that the focus is on relationships, relationships, building relationships. So among those um, P, uh, possibilities, um, uh, responsibilities are employee relations community relations, investor relations, consumer relations, uh, media relations, crisis management, 
and dealing with um, problems and opportunities, doing research, planning, uh, communicating, evaluating, and utilizing the digital technologies toward advancing a company's uh, strategies. Again, as a public relations in this digital age, you are in control of the message. Um, you can craft the message. Another important aspect of public relations is ethical conduct, e extremely important, social responsibility and ethical conduct. Uh, PR practitioners must adhere to the highest ethical standards, avoid lying, misleading, and manipulating uh, people. So ethical uh, conduct is based on what is right or acceptable, uh, what is wrong or unacceptable in, a, uh, in each society, in a given society, uh, including behavior, uh, respect for people, norms, uh, transparency, extremely important uh, to be honest, open, transparent, fairness, that is equal treatment, integrity, uh, truthfulness, and uh, trust. And in my opinion, trust is extremely important because in any relationship, if there is no trust, the rest is meaningless. So building trust is an extremely important aspect of what public relations people do. Uh, today, we live in, in an interconnected and polarized world. You all know that, it's unfortunate. Uh, yes, the digital technologies have connected uh, people around the globe. But unfortunately, we live in a highly polarized, divisive, violent, and tense global environment. And that uh, should uh, uh, be alarming to many of us. Only in a humanitarian context, we can arrive at a plausible meaning for individual, media, and corporate social responsibility. Ethics, social responsibility, both are extremely important in what public relations people do. So, and that, all that has to be based on mutual respect, mutual understanding, and two-way communication and cooperation. In our today's complex societies, there is more need for educated and informed public relations practitioners than ever before. Consequently, the need for PR practitioners is on the rise and within the communication field, public relations, uh, job opportunities um, have been uh, increasing. Now, especially for those practitioners, and this is true, especially for those practitioners who possess multiple skills. Again, as a PR uh, practitioners, you must uh, be familiar with various aspects of uh, media, media production, uh, journalism, uh, uh, politics, uh, psychology, sociology, and so on. So for those practitioners who possess multiple skills and understand uh, the opportunities presented to them by the new digital media, and how do you use the digital media? How do you use these platforms? And what are your strategies? Um, the good thing is that 
uh, you are now in control of the message. Uh, you do not have to go through the, a gatekeeper as before. Um, and as you know, you can establish your own blog, you can newsletter, um, and you can have your own list and be in contact uh, nationally and globally with uh, various people. And finally, um, like everything else, public relations has evolved and changed. And we change as well. And uh, therefore, it is essential that the practitioners utilize the available social media channels and stay ahead of the curve in this digital global environment. A complex society requires a knowledgeable public relations practitioner. A complex society requires a knowledgeable public relations practitioner. I know many of you are going to talk about the various aspects of what I just briefly mentioned, and I look forward to your presentation. Uh, thank you for the opportunity and uh, uh, best wishes to all of you. We are muted. Thank you, Professor Kamalipur, for this presentation. Very interesting um, summary of the concept of public relations and how it's different from advertising. She talked about what defines public relations being a strategic function, a management function, and the importance of ethics, mutual relationships in public relations. Um, I, I, would, I would love for anyone to uh, ask their questions. We have like a five minute Q&A session before we move on to the uh, forthcoming panel. So everyone is welcome to uh, send or ask their questions. We have five minutes to do that uh, right now. So any questions? Can, can, can I, yes. Uh, Professor, you spoke about social responsibility, but if you look at the DNA of public relations today, which is uh, where the, the entire, I would say, the game has moved to social media, which is managed and governed by everybody or I would say nobody. Everyone is a journalist and everybody is uh, consuming and sharing news there. Uh, how do we bring the element of social responsibility in this new age of public relations? Uh, any comments, any views you have? Um, I agree with you that, uh, you know, nowadays anyone can be a journalist and any, anyone can produce and post uh, videos and information online. Uh, but as consumers of information, we always have to look at the um, sources of information. Where is it coming from? You know, that is uh, often overlooked. And when it comes to social responsibility, it depends on where we are, in what country, in which city, uh, what, are, what are the issues, what are the problems, that the key is that companies and organizations that operate within a given, uh, uh, let's say city or society uh, must take into consideration the issues and problems that exist and do something about them. That is being socially responsible, whether it is poverty, whether it, there are issues related to um, environment, uh, pollution, air pollution, and uh, water pollution. And then uh, there is no shortage of problems, unfortunately. Uh, we have created, as humans, we have created so many problems. 
And now we have to think, how do we solve these problems, right? So social responsibility means that uh, corporations, uh, organizations, agencies, uh, governmental, non-governmental, private, um, and so forth, they have to pay attention to the environment in which they operate because a better environment contributes to a more successful um, uh, corporation and company. So there is a, you know, it's a mutually beneficial action. Social responsibility is extremely important in any uh, given situation and should not be overlooked. Thank you, Professor. Any other questions? Um, here's a question uh, from Monisha Qadiri. She says, thanks, Professor. My question is, do you see ethics being impacted in this world of digital platforms and content creation where most of the brand's organizations are trying to reach and impact more and more people? At times, content is posted quickly without Verifying, mm. Professor. Yes, um, an, an excellent point. Uh, you know, one of the, I guess, the issues or problems with the, in this digital age and the various platforms, it is um, easy for us uh, to uh, respond without thinking. It is easy for us to write without thinking, okay? And uh, I mean, before the internet, uh, uh, we used to, whether it, we wrote a uh, news release or uh, uh, a, a story or what have you, uh, it went through several edits before it was submitted or be before it was published. Nowadays, it's uh, spontaneous. Okay, and in this process, uh, you know, the uh, problems can arise, people can be offended. So that is, as a PR practitioners, uh, you must think of the consequences of the message, you must rethink, reread, rewrite your, your message before sen sending it on. And uh, again, that's uh, an issue of ethic and ethical uh, uh, conduct. Uh, again, it's overlooked. Ethics, like social responsibility, both of them are often overlooked, especially in um, uh, developing countries uh, and including, of course, the uh, uh, advanced countries as well. But those two are extremely important. Uh, thank you, Professor. I think now we are going to move ahead to start the uh, first panel. I'm going to uh, move the floor to the moderator of this panel discussion, Mr. Ganesh Chandra Sikaran from India. So please, Ganesh, you can start the panel. Thank you, uh, Mr. Hashem Mazba. And it was um, also to the earlier speaker, Mr. Yahya. And uh, the topic that has been given is a pretty interesting one on the uh, power of social media and its impact on social, economic, political sketch of Asia. And given that you have over a billion uh, mobile phones, which uh, are, have now become uh, a, a kind of a content uh, uh, creating tool in the hands of the public is now uh, it's it's now having a lot of impact as well. And uh, the reason why I say that the topic is relevant as social media's growth has seen a pivotal impact on the political and uh, the business environment in this part of the world and across the globe as well at both the micro and the macro level. And uh, I was just reading a, a Brooklyn's report and which said that the volume of information which is surrounding us continues to multiply at an exponential rate brought about by advances in technologies 
and economies at scale. And, uh, and there was also another report, which I was also uh, looking at, which is uh, published by the technology firm Cisco. And it says that uh, the amount of content or the videos that has been published so far, uh, it would take about a 5 million years to watch the amount of videos that has been published on the internet, which is, uh, uh, which is on one side uh, looks pretty scary. On, on the other side, it also uh, shows the amount of uh, information expl explosion that is happening around us. And uh, if you look at from the uh, who uses social media? Well, it is used not just by individual users, but it is also being used by the government, uh, the political parties, the politicians, many of the public figures and influencers, and also uh, largely the businesses as of today, because advertising has now slowly moved on to the social media as well. Earlier, it used to, it was in uh, the print or maybe the television, it's now moved to the social media. So given this background, I uh, would like to introduce the uh, uh, panelists for this particular uh, session. Uh, I would like to introduce uh, Hanzade Uralman, who is, uh, works as a chairperson of the public relations and advertising uh, at the uh, Okan uh, University. Uh, uh, she has received a, a PhD in public relations program at Marmara University and holds a MA in Museum Studies from Yilze Technical University and a BA in Librarianship from Istanbul. And prior to her PhD, she worked as a research assistant and uh, has also lectured in the field of public relations in many communication forums for the last uh, decade or so. And uh, the uh, second person uh, is Dr. Zulmari Abdullah, who's a resident faculty and associate professor of corporate communication at the Department of Communications, FBMK University, uh, Putra, Malaysia. He earned his PhD in public relations from Cardiff University, uh, United Kingdom, and also has a postgraduate diploma in entrepreneurship from Cambridge. He leads the global uh, capability framework for a Malaysian chapter with Professor Anne Gregory. Which is uh, and is supported by the Global Alliance for Public Relations. And he has also published over 150 articles and uh, uh, as a senior and over 60, uh, around 60 articles as a senior author on the topics of corporate communications. And his current research uh, interests include corporate communications, organizational communications, corporate uh, reputations. The third person in the panel is Professor Dr. Syed Abdul Siraj, who's uh, serving as a senior professor of uh, media studies uh, department at Bahria University, Islamabad, and our neighbor, in fact. And uh, he carries over 35 years of teaching and research experience. And in addition, he has served as a visiting scholar at foreign and national universities. He holds a master's in journalism with, dis uh, with distinction a doctorate in mass communication and a postdoctorate in media studies from the University of Southern Illinois, USA. Ms. Uh, Mr. Siraj has a vast curriculum development experience and is a national and international member of media societies and various forums. And he has won lots of awards, scholarships and research projects. He has authored over 60 research papers in international and national journals and participated in various international conferences. In addition, to this, Mr. Siraj has produced many books and chapters on mass media and communication and worked as editor of two prestigious recognized journals, Journal of Social Sciences and Humanities and Global Media Journal of the Pakistan uh, edition. And finally, uh, uh, the, uh, finally, the other panelist is uh, um, Ms. Mani Lamba, who's a senior marketing and communication uh, uh, plus a business leader with over 18 years of experience in building and managing various businesses. She has worked in, uh, worked on a, a variety of strategic initiatives in, uh, with particular emphasis on managing high intensity projects requiring quick turnaround and having a large audience engagement, which is quite relevant to the topic of the day today, which is on social media. And she has a strong theory and practice and foundation in corporate communications. And uh, her core competency lies in situational analysis and resource optimization. 
uh, Ms. Mani brings on board strong organization and mentoring leadership skills. And she has started a career with a leading research firm in India and has gained uh, extensive knowledge in the communication space over a period of, say, the last uh, 18, 20 years now. And uh, she moved to head the corporate communication di uh, division of one of the uh, leading uh, chamber of commerce and industry in India. During her stint, she con conceptualized and designed various uh, measures to position and promote the multifaceted activities of the chamber and has worked closely with the government, corporates, internal and external uh, agencies and media. And currently she's now uh, into PR consulting and also managing uh, communications for a host of clients and from diverse fields. And uh, yeah, and given, given this uh, say background of say some of the stalwarts in the industry, I throw the door open for them to, for their first uh, say a few comments on the topic. The floor is yours. So uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Hanzande, do you want to start? Yeah, yeah, I, I, in that I, order, yeah. Can I share my slide? Do you hear me? I'm sharing my slide. Yes, yes, yes. We can hear you. Please go ahead. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here in this summit, Asia Communication Summit, with my colleagues. And it's. I want to thank all the people who organized this uh, wonderful meeting, which is the first, as far as I know, uh, this year. Uh, I will talk about today uh, about the profile of Turkey on social media use for PR purposes. Uh, I'll give some uh, facts and figures and uh, I'll, I'm going to put forward the issues that uh, need to be considered uh, and discussed about the social media use for PR purposes. As all we know, social media is an internet based form which allows users to have conversations uh, share information and create web content. There are many forms of social media, including blogs, um, wikis, social networking channels, photo sharing sites, etc. And use of these media differs from country to country. Uh, it depends on cultural, social, political issues in the countries. Uh, my content, my talk, uh, actually has mainly two parts. One is Turkey from global perspective. Uh, I'll share my vision here and it was based on uh, digital global overview report data uh, in 2022. It will, uh, I'll cover the issues internet adaption for social media use, social media use of public, social networks profile, use of social media as consumer, then I'll focus in on inside of Turkey, uh, and I will talk about preferences of public and internet and social Doctor, media. Doctor, you're not audible. Can you come closer to the microphone, please? Huh. Is that okay? Maybe I can... Okay. If you can turn on the volume a little bit. Turn on? The volume, the sound on your computer, okay, if you uh, pull it up a little bit. How is it so if now? you can, if, yeah, if you can come closer to the mic, please. How is it now? Is that okay? No. Yeah, it's better. Uh, I would like to raise these issues by looking at the topic from uh, two main points, as I said. Uh, and uh, latest data, let's start. Uh, technical infra infrastructure for social media use in Turkey from global perspective. Uh, it shows 94% uh, people have internet access in Turkey. And we see in these figures, Turkey is uh, above the average in global, yeah. uh, globally. 
uh, UC internet use according to the digital global overview report in 2022 uh, this year the ratio of total population of to internet usage is 62.5 percent worldwide in Turkey right. the rate is much more higher and time spent on internet is again high in a higher level and uh, internet speed connection speed is in the high this is uh, this shows the technical abilities of the country. It's important because we know information economy based on networks and based on quality. Uh, it's important to have that connection in PR world today because information economy is network based on quality, uh, which technical infrastructure is needed. Uh, then it can be economy uh, information economy needed customization and customer driven this is the second part uh, when we look at social media use social media use of public uh, particularly look at the figures on social media in turkey they are above the average users between the age of 16 64 uh, this uh, survey has done among these people and spent in Turkey, people spent two hours, 59 minutes in Turkey. It's 30 minutes higher than the average. And video games still, we are in Turkey, ranked seventh in this topic. And podcasts are common, as you see in these figures. And digital broadcasting, how is my voice, uh, by the way? <laughs> is it coming clear? Mina, you're muted. Um. How is my voice? Is it sufficient? It's a little bit weak. The sound signal is weak. I don't, I'm not sure if you can turn on the level of the volume on your computer, you, the microphone yeah, yeah, of I your did. computer. I already did. Maybe I can, uh, headphones. Hold on. I'll use headphones, maybe it works. I'm not sure. Okay. How is it right now? Perfect. Okay. <laughs> Um, I think something wrong with my computer. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Uh, when we particularly look at these figures, podcasts, digital broadcasting, voice search and comment system use, and Instagram mobile application is a, a higher, much more higher than the average in the world. But some of the figures uh, we see here uh, on the other hand, uh, are less uh, than the world. Uh, they are uh, YouTube mobile uh, spent on you, the YouTube mobile, Facebook mobile application spent on this social me uh, media network channel and uh, WhatsApp mobile application. And and I also, I, will, I would like to share social media use of public as consumers. It's a different perspective because it's about brand researching, online shopping, online purchasing, and financial service usage. Uh, still, we can see uh, Turkey is adapted to social media in consuming. Uh, we can see the figures here. I, I'm not going to take, uh, I'm going to, uh, give short in, uh, brief information about that. You see the percentage of the figures. Uh, from the advertising perspective, uh, ad reach is very successful. People reach of Facebook ads, uh, Instagram ads, YouTube ads, and TikTok ads uh, much more higher than the average in the world. And uh, only LinkedIn uh, ads worldwide is uh, about, uh, below the average. Uh, 
social networks used by public, uh, how many, when we asked, uh, when we investigated, uh, how many social networks used by public, uh, it's much more higher than the world average. And time and device preferences phone, that means uh, we, in Turkey, people uh, use phone as a device and they spend at least one hour, uh, between one hour and two hours on social media and in, on internet. And when we see the preferences of public on internet and social media, they mostly spend time, they prefer to spend time on uh, internet and socializing and connecting to social media. And you see the other uh, options here are connected to uh, social media platforms, watching movie, movie, following the news. We can see that still the answers sh uh, shows that people spend time and people prefer social media to use. And these are the, we see the increase in Turkey in use of internet. And these are the reasons to increase use of internet. Uh, and again, preferences of public on internet and social media. Uh, WhatsApp come first, Instagram second, and YouTube third. Uh, prefer, uh, they prefer YouTube in third. Uh, you see the figures here. Um, and when we look at closer look at contents followed on Instagram, uh, which are the most used social network channel. People use Instagram mostly to get information to entertain and, to entertain and so socialize. Information content, news and entertaining content are mostly preferred on Instagram and reaching people and institutions are not common purpose to use Instagram. This is, uh, uh, this is one of the points to think about in PR. Uh, another thing, content followed on YouTube, uh, I would like to share the figures here, uh, the reasons people use YouTube, listen to music, spend time, watch series and movies and to get information. Unlike Instagram, people consider more political content, musical and dramatic productions on YouTube as its characteristics. Uh, refers to that. And on TV, political issues comes to first. Twitter considered as a news source and people used to reach information and to get updated about politics uh, to support political hashtags which draws different characteristics than other platforms and entertaining is again uh, another purpose to use social media and Facebook uh, use Facebook people use Facebook to reach people and institutions more than other platforms as with other platforms, having fun and being informed are the, are the most stated purposes. Uh, what does it say to us? Uh, I'm come to that point. Uh, we see trust in social media, uh, which Professor Kamalipur uh, stated that about trust. Trust in social media knowledge is in higher level in Turkey. Uh, this is actually one of the things to be discussed uh, because in comparison to other media platforms such as TV, radio, newspaper, people believe social media a lot here. You see the figures. Uh, this is one of the points I come to conclusion in, my, in this figures. So I'll talk about in the conclusion again. Uh, because we spend time a lot, in this, as you see in this figures, we spend time in Turkey, people living in Turkey spend a lot of time in, uh, on social media channels and they spend time, they say that they, they use for spending time social media and at least one hour, two hours. So trust is an issue here. Uh, from the brand's perspective, uh, in Turkey, brands use social media strategically. There are over 300 social media agencies in Turkey and various errors are given in social media category. 
what they do when we look at closer look at the brand's efforts on social media, they do commercial films shot for brand institution organization to be broadcast on TV, cinema or digital media. Brands have media applications, creative media studies, innovative applications and inspiring media usage ideas. Creative PR studies are carried out in order to improve the reputation of the brand and to establish strength and communication between the brand, product and its target audience. And social responsibilities, sustainability projects are developed for a better world as uh, one of the leading issues in public relations world. And projects that provide experience for customers by enabling brands to meet their target audience in creative and original ways. Uh, and reputation is another uh, reputation of brands, improving reputation of brands and to establish connection between the brand and its target audience, another thing. Uh, what says to us when we look at closer look at the PR campaigns, visual and audio quality is important when the, in Turkey. When the brand content included in social brands evaluation, which, is a, uh, which they do every year, uh, when, we, when I looked for the period on December 2021 are examined, the contents with the highest interaction on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, shaped by Istanbul Airport, Netflix, and Trendio. <clears throat> they, have, uh, they have image quality, uh, and they have three, uh, 80 music effects video content. Uh, and storytelling, another thing uh, we can figure out storytelling or integrating brands to stories. As all we know, PR is also storytelling. But uh, in social media in Turkey, uh, brands are integrated. They prefer to integrate brands to stories, uh, yeah. established stories. Excuse yeah. me? Anthony, just uh, one moment, please. OK. Come to conclusion then, uh, I, I was going to uh, show some examples maybe they will ask uh, okay social media is a powerful tool P for PR in Turkey this is scary in some ways does it support power of public or who does the high rate of social media usage in Turkey threaten the public second thing I want to focus Trust on social media is high level among public and social media is regarded much more trustworthy than news and channels. Is it ethically correct? Is there really reliable information on social media? Do public relations specialists have ethical responsibilities in the face of the problem of unreliability of tra traditional media? How should social media be used on political communication strategy to avoid this chaos? Third thing is stories are at the forefront on digital forms in Turkey. This is a situation that should be taken into account for brands. Stories are at the forefront on digital platforms. This is a situation that should be taken into account for brands. In this case, what should be the strategy for brands on social media? Should brand use popular figures on movies as it is before, series from music world, or should they able to create celebrities or stories, their own stories? Does PR sector depend on movie or music industry? This is another question group. Uh, and last thing I want to say, is there is a necessity for audio and visual quality. Is this perceived as a problem for small business communication or non-governmental organizations with a low budget? Is there any new ways to develop communication for these organizations? These are the questions uh, I want to ask and need to be answered. Uh, in the literature when we think about Turkey or Asia or whatever. Um, thank you. I think yeah, I'm on you. time. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Hanzandi. And uh, I request now uh, Dr. Uh, Zulmari Abdullah to... Uh, uh, going to stop sharing, sorry. Yes. Yeah. Uh, couldn't. Okay. All right. Uh, Assalamu alaikum and very good evening.
to all. Uh, I'm Zul Hamri from uh, Malaysia. Uh, it is an honor to present my paper in this Asia Communication Summit. Uh, thank you very much to the organizer, especially uh, Professor Yahya Kamali Bor for this opportunity. Uh, we had a very good uh, relationship, I think that's, you know, for the last 10 years ago. All right, uh, let me share the screen. Uh, okay. Right, I, I guess that I have only uh, maybe a 10 or 15 minutes. I try to make it, I think, at times. Right. Um, the, you can see the title about the reframing a global public relation framework. Uh, this is a Malaysian uh, perspective. Uh, let's see, I think that's, you know, the global uh, capability framework brief. I think that's, if we see that um, the professors, uh, Yahya Kamal Matur, I think that's uh, speaking about the public relation in digital age. So I think that in the public relation also, we need to see that what is, I think that the, uh, the, 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 the professionalism, how to going to improve the professionalism among the PR practitioners, educators, and also think that's you not know, among the communities. So this, I think that um, this uh, capability framework uh, offer the practical value to the global alliance eh, and also the affiliated professional bodies and their members worldwide. Uh, I think this also model, we, we, we see that, try to see that they reflect uh, cultural and regional variation in the public relation has a global profession and be forward uh, looking in the approach and try to meet the rigorous academic standards as well. All right. Uh, Professor Anne Gregory, that's you know, started this, uh, I think about five years ago, this research with, uh, I think, uh, nine countries. Uh, that is the first phase one. So uh, in the phase uh, two, uh, these are things that come from the Asian country. You see that uh, myself from the, we have from the UAE, from the Colombia, from the Indonesia, from the Ecuador. And we hope that we have more, I think, that countries will participate in this uh, a global capability uh, framework. Um, right. Um, in this research, we, we try to ask three questions. It's going to be uh, qualitative and quantitative. The first question, do the share, uh, shared set of the PR capabilities represented in the global capital framework define the profession in Malaysia, right? So that's the first question. I think that this will be, you know, going to show that some of the results later. And then the research question two, what are the variation of the global capability framework that are applicable within the Malaysian context? Okay, so this, I think that's the very, very relevant in Asia because we don't want to only the copy the Western story, but we need to adapt this to the Asian country, especially Malaysia, right? Uh, because Malaysia is a multinational, multi-ethnic country, multi-religious country as well. Uh, and research questions uh, three, how can the global capability framework be of use in the Malaysia at the individual organization and profession level? You will see this uh, framework is a very, very comprehensive. I'm going to show you some results here. Right, this study uh, took me, I think, uh, three years. Uh, started from the 1990s, uh, uh, 2019s, uh, that during the pandemic, actually. But before the pandemic, already started this. But I think that I tried to manage uh, uh, this, I think, early this year, uh, January, yeah? by January, and presented uh, this to the, some of the conferences. You can see that starting with the Delphi study, online survey, in-depth interviews, and so on. I think that, you know, we already, I think that come up with the uh, 70 pages, uh, I think the uh, reports on this and try to get it published in the, uh, in the top journals as well, right? But I have already the infographic report, if, if you, you, you think that you're interested to read it. Okay. I'm going to just give a summary only. I'm not going to you know, go very detailed on that. So DEFI study, I think that you can see that in terms of looking at the important the capabilities for the, by, the, by reference. We don't, I think that mostly, I think that's, you know, when they talk about the professionalism, people, you know, focusing on the comp competency, but this is a based on the capability because the capability it can give, I think that's, you know, focus more on the 
I think that the, the capability of the individual organizations and also the association as a whole. So we see that the first ranking here executes the high level of communication with the key stakeholders and organization strategical approaches. And then we see that you know, um, when the prof uh, Kalima, Kali, uh, Kali, uh, Kamali Kaur, I think, you know, uh, presented about you know, the ethics, talking to, about uh, social media, how are you going to control this? So I think that this is what I think that the PR practitioners need. They need to have, I think that, you know, the high level of communication so that they are the one, I think that, because they are the, the, the we can see the boundary spanner. Those, I think, the person who connect to everyone, eh? external and also the internal, eh? uh, I think their relations eh? within the, within and also outside the organizations. And then, uh, of course, that number ranking number two, organize and plan a communication strategy based on the ethical framework. So these are also answer some of the questions that we asked, I think that during the session, as well as enhance the public trust to the ethical communication. So this is a very, very important. This is what we are concerned. In Malaysia also, we are so concerned about that. If I think that um, Prof Hanzet, I think that you know, you're presented about the, the, the power of social media in Turkey, same thing I think that in Malaysia, so we also afraid this is social media, yeah? So we, we want to think that the being, I think that ethical framework must be, I think, established, yeah? And the public trust also must be, I think, that served as well. Okay, this, I think that some of the uh, 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 sample of the profile, I think that the sample is quite uh, small, 58 uh, here. But because I think that we do the, uh, we, uh, we do the mixed uh, methodology, not only focusing on the quantitative here, okay? And some, I think that, I'm going to present the three important capabilities here. First is the communication capabilities. Second is organizational capabilities. And the third uh, is the professional capabilities. To make it, this framework is a very, very comprehensive. I think these are some things that, you know, the result you can see here in terms of the planning uh, communication in aligning with a strategic purpose. Now, I think that, you know, second is communicating effectively across traditional and digital channels. I think that's quite important. In terms of organizational capability, you can see there also uh, very, very important for the PR communities. They see that the organization's uh, uh, capabilities is very, very important and how going to manage. So these are things that will reflect, I think that the capability uh, for the departments of public relation. So in Malaysia, we also use a diversity of the name, uh, Department of Corporate Communication, Department of Corporate Affairs, but they maybe have, I think that, you know, uh, it could be a, a, a very function that what I think the Prof Yahya Kamal uh, I think that's mentioned yeah, earlier. And you can see the in terms of cap professional capabilities. This is a very, very indiv individual. So we need that, you know, the PR communities, they have, I think, that the strong, I think, that, you know, values in terms of the individual, providing and promoting the responsible leadership, governance, this is very, very important. developing staff and others through the CPD. So this is also quite important huh? among the professional capability. Okay, now we move on to the in-depth interview, the second methodology for this research. That, uh, sorry, the, this is the third one. Okay, we have the first one, Delphi study. Second is the online survey. And the third one is the in-depth interview. This is mean, I think there's a study uh, for this research, all right? And you can see here in terms of uh, the, Descriptive analysis we, is only the, uh, we find the key themes of this research and the finding of the PR capabilities. I just go straight to the finding here in terms of the communication capabilities among the communication strategies is very important. Communication of the problems and proactively. I think these are going to manage the crisis communication. Yeah, Evaluative research. So PR practitioners also need to do more research on I think that, you know, what uh, the scenario or any events going to, I think that's, you know, manage. Platform technologies. So this is also very, very important. This is what we're going to talk today about the digital age, social media, how to use in the Instagram, TikTok. I think TikTok also very popular in Malaysia now, right? And then organizational capabilities, because we wanted every organization, they develop departments, uh, department of public relations, department of corporate communication. So relationship with the stakeholders, very, very important. Organizational reputations. This also that because um, organization will protect the reputation of the companies. And I think that what important here is a contextual intelligence. This is also very, very important yeah, in, in, in Malaysia as well. 
and in terms of professional capabilities, the PR practitioner should be, I think that have, I think that it could be the strategic council and advisor. They are the one that I think that if I think that someone, if they have a problems, I think that issues, they will come, I think that uh, do uh, uh, get advice from these uh, PR practitioners. Leadership one capability. Two, Dr. Zulmari, just two minutes. Let's okay, go. all right, yeah. thank you so much. Leadership capabilities. This, I think that I, th I think that we need to stress on this as, as well, because there can be, I think that the, one of the board directors, ethical practices and continuous learnings uh, professional learning, right? And this is the thing where we, we use uh, NVivo and we got, I think that, you know, the, 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 frame, the conceptual framework like this. I think that's, you know, uh, referring to the, uh, the key themes that I mentioned earlier. So the implications so, uh, for this study, first and the implication, I think that, of course, that this study will advance the global capability frameworks, you know, based on the Malaysian capabilities. Second, I think that uh, Malaysian prayer practices still in matter and should be, I think, that still rely on the international role rather than I think that being a more strategist. And the third, I think that it is still debatable that Malaysian population practice can be a members of the dominant coalition. I think more, I think that we found that uh, this is a thing that's something unique about Malaysia. Cultural capability should be emerged as a new dimension uh, of this, uh, uh, the framework, right? I think that this is a thing that uh, we see in terms of the, I'm going to skip this because we don't have uh, much time. And I think in terms of recommendation that we forward to audit the profile of professional capabilities among the, using the, uh, we have the assessment uh, using the software, right? And enhance the role of publication profession, uh, association and widen the more strategic collaboration with the other Asian countries. As a conclusion, we see that the broad alignment on capabilities, yeah, uh, from the Westerns in the Asians, this is what we see. But what I think is something different we see here, the, the, the cultural uh, context, yeah, the context. Uh, so this is the context, the king here become a king, because I think that maybe this is a part of thing that, you know, the, what I think that we're trying to empower the practitioners, professional bodies and employers. So uh, I think that this uh, research I think that we try to share this among, uh, with the Institute of Public Relations Malaysia, and I think that uh, we're going to share this with the uh, other Asian association as well, so that we want to have a bigger, I think, the PR communities, not only in, in, in Asia as well. Okay, with that, I think that um, I say thank you. And I think terima kasih. I think that's, you know, uh, that's all my presentation today. Thank you so much. Back to uh, uh, Ganesh. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Zulmari. It was a wonderful study, in fact, and very uh, detailed and insightful. And I request now Dr. Syed Abdul Siraj to give his presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, am I audible, please? Yes. OK, thank you very much. So I'm very grateful to the conference management for inviting me to this uh, very important international uh, conference. Uh, especially on the use of uh, social media for public relation. I'm happy to be, I, I'm very happy to present my discourse before this uh, galaxy of renowned scholar uh, around the world, spe specifically from South Asia, Malaysia, uh, Turkey, and other part of the Asia. My topic for this, uh, for this uh, in this uh, conference for discussion would be the sociology of social media in Pakistan. My two colleagues, friends uh, from Turkey and Malaysia explain very well the role of uh, uh, social media for public relation in their specific country. But here, uh, since uh, the topic uh, of the conference is very wide, it's relating to politics, it's relating to social issues, it's relating to economics, it relating to entertainment and so many other aspects, health, etc. So I would be, you know, in my discourse, in my explanation, I would be try to explain the social media use or the social media sociology relating to all these area as a journal. So would that be okay? Would that work? Okay. Before before we. Uh, I say something on the media sociology specifically for Pakistan. I want to just a little, 
give a little bit overview of the social media use uh, in this postmodern and globalized world. And it would make things easy for me and for you to understand what's the media sociology in Pakistan. You know, the use of social media has immensely increased in the last decade. Uh, dependency on social media for change. Uh, you know, people's everyday practice uh, is almost uh, a different phenomenon today. Social media is something persuasive annoying, time-wasting, time-efficient, helpful, and useless. Uh, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Snapchat, WhatsApp, Tutors, LinkedIn, and MySpace are the prominent social media tools for instant messaging, sharing photos, video sites, apps, blogs, etc. The increased use of social media transformed the world and brought people closer to one another. Entertainment and social media affected the traditional media and changed the technique of advertising and public relation altogether. Social media has increased an information overloaded phenomena. This is very important. Creating confusion about what to understand and what to think. Now I'm going to explain what is the social media use and its sociology in Pakistan. The scenario of media, social media use in Pakistan is not very different uh, from the other part of the world. Though Pakistan is a developing country, still there is a significant increase in the use of social media, especially the medium is very popular among the youth. Social media users in Pakistan are growing and getting access to the wider range of educational, entertainment, and business opportunity, enhancing their prosperity, confidence, and ability to take part in this global activities as a global citizen as well. Compared to advanced country, internet activity in Pakistan is low. Nevertheless, Pakistan has significantly increased mobile broadband over the past six years. According to annual digital growth report in Pakistan in 2021, the social media users are 39 million, which is about 40% of the total population in Pakistan. It is very, very low than Turkey and Malaysia as explained by the internet penetration is 49.4 percent for 49.4 million among the active users. The active social user growth in Pakistan is about 6 percent. The average time the user spend on social media is about 130 to 230 hours daily. 40 percent of those aged 15 to 65 know about the use of Wi-Fi internet. The mobile connectivity of 3G and 4G reach 75% of the population. 20% of Pakistanis are good at using the internet and social media. Many mobile phone services companies are operating in Pakistan. Among the most popular are Viewphone, Zone, uh, Jazz, and MobileLink. The most popular phone set used in Pakistan are UFO, iPhone, Samsung, and Huawei. The price of mobile phone services and internet broadband connectivity in Pakistan is comparatively lower than the developing countries like uh, the developed countries like the UK and USA, and some developing uh, some other developing countries. However, Many people uh, still don't uh, have access to internet uh, a smartphone. As told, internet connectivity is not very expensive in Pakistan. Still, not everyone is using them equally. And this leads a gap between information rich and information poor society. I still believe that Pakistan's use of social media in health, economic, education, politics, 
public sphere, commerce, entertainment, etc., has significantly increased. Uh, let me discuss uh, this one by one. Social media and politics, that's very important in Pakistan. We are using social media and politics uh, to any level. You know, there is a research study myself and uh, under my supervision conducted, and it is on the intermedia inter agenda setting effects between social and traditional media on, polit on political and social issues in Pakistan. And it reveals that social media significantly influences conventional media content. And now the social media is setting agenda for the traditional media on political and social issues in Pakistan. These studies mostly used, you know, in Pakistan and other countries, these studies happened there and it used a cross lab correlation techniques, analysis technique. Politicians are regularly using Twitter to advance their propaganda, political agenda. Political parties, political parties have established media cells using social media for political propagandas. Political parties pay money to popular journalists for traditional, of traditional media for publishing story and vlog on social media to favor and oppose political parties and leaders. Political memes on social media are regular as a regular feature of uh, Facebook. These memes contain positive and negative images of popular famous political leaders. Political narrative on social media is hyperactive and thus create polarity in the, in the politics of Pakistan. So this is a little bit explanation about uh, so use of social media in politics because there's a time shortage. I'm not going to explain it in detail, but these are the key area. Social media and health. There is the intensive use of social media in Pakistan for health awareness about polio, vaccination, hygiene, population control, uh, protection from dengue fever and other health issues. The use of social media during the COVID-19 pandemic in Pakistan has been appreciated very high. During the pandemic, people use social media more than the traditional media and trusted government sources for the related information and events. So this is a little bit about uh, health. Now I'm going to say a just a uh, gist of the use of social media for public sphere. Government and NGOs use social media consistently for public issues such as disaster management, flooding, earthquake, pandemic, weather forecast, traffic safety, remote tourism, health issues, Google Earth, uh, Google Earth et cetera, whatever. Social media and education. The integrated use of technology and social media in schools, colleges, and universities has acclaimed students' education benefits in Pakistan. Educational institutions in Pakistan increasingly use social media for students' information about admission, class schedule, curricula, and extracurricular activities. Social media allows more email e-learning opportunities. For example, all the universities during the COVID-19 pandemic use e-learning teaching methods such as uh, MS Team and Zoom, et cetera. There is a high demand for jobs in social, in social media and digital media, especially in the peer department of government and private organization. Therefore, most of the university, most of the media department of universities have launched four year bachelor program in social and digital media. Dr. And Siraj, they, one more minute. Come, come in. Okay. Yeah. Okay, social media and hyper reality. You know, research studies argue that social media users live in a perpetual present and perpetual change. Social media promote parody, irony, and playfulness. In Pakistan, it is observed that social media entertainment and commercial content promote uh, multinational consumer-based capitalism. Uh, 
young people are highly addicted to social media even even more than the cigarette and other such things instagram is uh, is, is a very useful platform and very harmful platform uh, for the young people mental health uh, there is a flood of uh, fake and misleading information on social media in pakistan on political and commercial and social issues uh, john budrellard says that the real does not disappear to the benefit of imaginary it disappear to the use of more real than the real this is hyper real and truer than the true and this is all you know fake and misleading things social this is the last part of my lecture please give me a little bit time social media and pakistani youth young pakistani young people mostly use social media for entertainment chatting exchanging photos etc so they upload mostly picture of parties wedding ceremonies di uh, dining shopping and traveling etc the reason for uploading such pictures to impress their friends and show that they live a happy life the tendency of lurking into other social uh, life is a common practice in pakistan a study of age 14 to 24 in pakistan shows that the worst effects of social media are self identity sleeping disorder body image depression emotional support loneliness bullying and self identity social media user in pakistan you will make a comparison of themselves with the other for self evaluation and self enhancement in pakistan female media female social media user involve more in social comparison by lurking into others life this frequency upload edited pictures to look at to look attractive and seek appreciation study shows that such people are generally not very you know they are satisfied from their life i wanted to you know explain more about uh, social media and security social media and entertainment social media and commercialism social media restriction in pakistan but the time is short for that thank you very much for listening to listen to me i'm grateful to all for giving me this opportunity thank you very much thank, yeah thank you dr siraj for touching upon a lot of areas and i think which is very very touchy and in fact it's almost like uh, it's kind of a sort of fact from fiction which is getting into <laughs> online and the current technology development is actually yeah. uh uh like you said it's uh, our own eyes are and ears are getting uh, uh are deceiving us is what i i would like to uh, say and uh, invite uh, uh ms mani lamba the last speaker in the panel to uh give her views on the social media and the socio economic development in asia thank you thank you ganesh uh, greetings to everybody uh the challenge of being a last panelist in a, in such a coveted panel is that there's hardly anything left to be spoken about everybody has thrown in some great numbers and uh, a lot of data and information about how social media has penetrated their respective countries and regions uh, what i'm going to talk about is not so much dependent on numbers uh, although i would say that uh, india is probably the third largest audience on a twitter platform uh, and similar similar achievements are there if i would say all the achievements on the other social media platforms as well as well but more important than just the numbers is the sheer penetration of social media in india which is truly overwhelming a country where even the basics are not in place in many parts of the region the social media growth is tremendous a large part of us thanks to the handheld devices we have information reaches people in matters of seconds any incident happens now and it you know across the world it is flashed in a matter of seconds because of our handheld devices and india of course has the largest number of handheld devices uh, in the world my discussion um, i will largely focus on some of the case studies which will show show us how deep deeply entrenched social media is into our entire socio economic political framework in india uh, dr siraj spoke extensively about covid-19 in fact this was the first time a pandemic was covered and reported on social media surely shared largely because of the sheer nature of 
the pandemic, but also social media became the one and only source of information sharing across the world because the, this was one pandemic that hit the world. Even government agencies, uh, WHO, all other medical fraternities extensively use social media to circulate correct information and eliminate any kind of mis misinformation which was floating across the globe. Many celebrities also jump in and use these platforms to raise awareness about cleaning hands, maintaining two, two feet distance, and various other campaigns which were supported by social media uh, by various celebrities in India. The most of you must have also heard stories about there was a time in India when at its peak when even the healthcare infrastructure almost collapsed. There were no hospital beds, there were no oxygen available, uh, crematorium started running out of space, there was no place to bury the dead. In these times, uh, social media became the lifeline for most of the people. Uh, lots of groups were created on social media, SOS messages on Twitter, Insta, Facebook were circulated. Lots of groups were created to help people uh, get oxygen cylinders, find hospital beds for people, uh, provide su uh, support to the needy where entire family was affected by COVID. They didn't even know where to get food from and uh, basics like food and uh, water was provided to some of these people and all through the social media network. Now, let me look at the flip side of this. During the same COVID time, some of the drugs were promoted as the drug to cure COVID. Um, Dolo 650, Remdesivir, some of these drugs were called the formula to, uh, to cure from COVID. And this is where I bring in the economic aspect where corporates use the social media framework to promote these drugs as the solutions uh, to cure COVID. Uh, while Dolo 650 is same as paracetamol or grossing that we know across the world, the salt is the same, the composition is the same. Just because one company could make a 650 potency medicine, it started promoting it as the drug uh, or as the cure for COVID-19 on social media. Lots of campaigns, they got in experts to, uh, medical experts to endorse their medicine. And uh, they had lots of campaigns running almost on a daily basis in social media to promote their drugs. Of course, at some point, uh, the truth came out that Dolo was not the only medicine, it was basically just, uh, it was just a paracetamol which could, or a PCM uh, salt that could have done the magic. Same for remdesivir, which, which was considered a solution at one point of time, was considered as a known drug for COVID solution. However, most some of these companies did make a lot of money during uh, COVID uh, just by using social media to promote their products. But having said that, let me go back almost a decade to, to a movement for India against corruption, which was started by a, a, a leader we had, Anna Hazare. This was, uh, this was purely channelized on social media. It happened in sometime in 2011 uh, to bring in a bill to appoint an ombudsman. Um, in Hindi, it is called Jan Lokpal as an independent, bo independent body to investigate corruption cases um, and protect the whistleblowers of the country, in the country. There was one day when at three o'clock, uh, a message was put on uh, Anna Hazare's social media platforms and India Against Corruption social media platforms so that everybody should converge at India Gate at 4 p.m. By 4.30, more than 5,000 messages were circulated and more than 15,000 people had already collected that in their head. This was, the, this was the power of social media more than 10 years ago. Over a period of time, more than a lakh Facebook followers came onto their platform, more than 5,000 Twitter supporters came in, and on certain days, 20 to 30 posts per minute were circulated on these platforms in 2011. The result was that after 12 days, of course, the, there were other things also that uh, played their role, but the kind of support and the kind of uh, the kind of 
support the social media brought was that in about 10, 12 days time, the government agreed to have a bill to bring the ombudsman in place. Around that time, I would also talk about a very unfortunate case which happened where a girl was raped uh, in the middle of the night in national capital of the country. From breaking the news to what happened afterwards, everything, everything was shared on social media. Social media became a powerful source of information. And in fact, it took over the role of medium to garner support in the entire nation. While the poor girl fought for her life uh, in various hospitals, it was the social media and the angst of the masses which brought people together on social media and a complete campaign was created which resulted in raised awareness, a lot of debates, debates around massive movement, which, which was generated for respect, of, respect and protection of women in India. Social media tools were utilized to inform, to mobilize and organize people. And this is more than a decade ago, this happened in India. The result was, well, unfortunately, the girl didn't survive, but the culprits were caught, they were, they were uh, in a fast track court, uh, they were punished and all of them were punished. And I think that to some extent, some justice was given to the poor girl. This, is, this was all, uh, the social media was so deeply entrenched in our system at that time. So whether you look at a social system, whether you look at a political system, you also look at the economic impact, uh, social, social media's impact on our economy. I also moved to another case study where, um, or okay, in terms of paucity of time, I'll skip that. But I will talk about the penetration of social media in the political uh, system of the country. Uh, in 2014 elections, the national elections is when the first social media elections, the first social media campaigns kick started. And it almost started as a social media revolution in Indian politics. The, uh, the uh, social media campaign of the BJP government at that time was built around building the brand of the prime ministerial candidate Narendra Modi and also promoting its development agenda. Some of you may have heard of this Achyadin Ainge campaign. This entire campaign was run on social media. The BJP savvy social media presence made sure that every other every other political party was left behind, and they worked on this Achyadin Ainge campaign to build a strong strong position for themselves uh, in 2014. Now you switch to 2019 elections uh, when the opposition came up by saying that uh, Chokidar Chota Chokidar means watchman. Uh, the ruling party uh, and the head of the party was is considered to be the uh, watchman and you know, there were allegations that some favors were given to certain people in, in, in certain cases, I will not name them, uh, by persons who were entrusted with safeguarding the public money. So what they said was that the watchman, the head of the organization, was actually a thief and he was laundering the money the public money. Uh, against this allegation, the BJP came up with a very unique social media campaign saying, maybe Chokidar, I'm also a watchman. Uh, so the prime minister of the country, he changed his uh, social media profile and called himself Chokidar Narendra Modi. Along with him, the entire, his entire members of parliament, council of ministers, his lakhs and lakhs of his NDA supporters, they all started calling themselves Chokidar, watchmen. And they all changed their profiles by saying, maybe Chokidar, I'm Chokidar, I'm a watchman. And the, the impact was so much that the Chokidar Chora, the watchman is a thief, thing was totally, totally um, erased from the memories of the audience. Likewise, another uh, uh, party, Amati Party, used uh, social media extensively for fundraising, for donations, to, to support their campaigns, etc. And they used a lot of their memes, their videos, and 
they created social media campaigns in local and vernacular languages to reach out to specific target audiences uh, across the country. There are multiple other case studies where uh, you know, there, was, there was a particular case where uh, a very celebrated uh, uh, minister, uh, Shashi Tharoor and his wife, uh, uh, their entire and uh, a love triangle with a journalist in of Pakistan came out in social media where the wife started sharing the, the personal tweets between the uh, husband and his friend on social media, which at some point led to a lot of discontent. Um, I think a lot of other distress also led to the death of uh, yeah. the wife. We have one more minute. Uh... I'm just closing it. I, I'll not talk yeah. about the other case studies I have, but what I want to say is that while social media activism brings an increased awareness about societal issues, we also need to see whether these this awareness is translating into real change. A lot of time we see a lot of campaigns that are run on social media camp uh, on social media platforms, but what is happening is that when it comes to on ground support, people just stay away. We just say we just like share and reshare and retweet and feel that our jobs are done. Whereas when it comes to really kind of providing support on ground, many of these things remain debatable. I'll close here. Uh, there's a lot to be spoken about this social media yeah. uh, in India. Um, but I think during our discussions, we can take some of those. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Yeah, Thank, thanks a lot to all the panelists. And it was wonderful, uh, right from say, panelists from Turkey to Malaysia, to Pakistan, to India, touching upon social media and the various angles that they brought in, right from politicians to say influencers, to businesses, as to how they use in terms of uh, uh, the social media. And in fact, the what uh, to sum up, I would like to say that social media has in fact, I would say that has marked the return of reliance of the uh, old word of mouth and communication that has traditionally played in the central role. And the other one is uh, along with the technological uh, innovation, technological innovation, there uh, it definitely is going to bring in a lot of new vulnerabilities, but as uh, I don't want to be pessimistic, but I see that there's a lot of opportunities and uh, for uh, all the uh, geographies, including South Asia, which can actually, if they exploit uh, the social media, uh, they're going to benefit out of it. And with this uh, closing remarks, I uh, hand back the mic to uh, Dr. Hisham. Thank you again to all the participants and the panelists. Thank you all for uh, the wonderful presentations from uh, four different countries in Asia. Asia is a, a magnificent continent that has its own social media uh, tools. Uh, before we, we conclude, do we have any questions to any of the panelists? If not, then I will move forward to the second panel and I will invite our second keynote speaker, Mr. Nguyen Ko Mi, Director of Business Development at GP Public Relations. He is going to um, present trust, transparency, and the truth in PR. Mr. Mi. Uh, hi everyone. Uh, I, I, I I've been so privileged to uh, listen to and 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 now I'm talking to uh, a board of very highly esteemed academic uh, professors, uh, doctors, directors. Uh, I may say um, I'm the least educated in terms of uh, PR, you know, academy uh, in this uh, entire forum. I'm a street fighter for real. I, I uh, let me share the screen a little bit uh, here. Right, I would like to. It doesn't work in here. The full screen uh, function. 
if you click on that little icon uh, on the left of the volume bar at the bottom yeah, of your screen. I'm trying to do it here. I'm trying to do it here. Excuse me for a second. Uh, I'm trying to uh, put it up to the full screen right now. It doesn't move. Um, excuse me. This is technical. Uh, can I can I go back to? Uh, excuse me. I think you should just go ahead and present. I mean, we yeah, can view you it, it, but if you can't uh, link between the slides, you will need to um, go out of it and then go back. Yeah, I can I can uh, go back in, excuse me. Uh, or else I think it shows 22%. I think you, you need to increase the font size. Yeah, it shows 22%, right? Just try to make it as, can you click on the plus at the bottom? Um, me, I think for the sake of keeping uh, the schedule um, intact, would you like to go ahead until the presentation works? Or if you want to email it to Mina and she can share it from her screen? Yeah, it seems so. Well, we can switch uh, the order. We can start with the panel then, and we can go back to me when he is ready, back, logged in, and maybe his presentation is ready. So uh, I will usher in the um, second panel. And um, the topic for this panel is cross-cultural communication in Asia barriers and impact. The moderator for this panel is Suraba Obu Wija from India. He is the managing partner, BOD Consulting, and he is on the advisory board of WCFA. Suraba, are you there? Yes, hi, hi, I'm absolutely here. Yeah, you can go, you can start. Thank you. 
Great. Thank you. Thank you, Hishun. And uh, warm greetings to uh, all the delegates and the panelists and the uh, the keynote speakers. Uh, so just to sort of start with, I'd like to uh, uh, thank uh, the president of WCFA, Maxim Bihar, and the convener of the Asia Communication Summit, uh, Mina Nazari, for uh, a truly, truly inspiring event. There is just so much knowledge being shared. And I think for the first time between participants across Asia, so which is uh, usually very rare, we don't have a format like that in any other part of the world. So many, many congratulations for that. Uh, so our panel today is on the topic of uh, cross-cultural communication in Asia, barriers and impact. And uh, we have uh, four really, really amazing uh, panelists who will uh, have a short talk of about 10 minutes each. And just to sort of introduce you to the topic and then later on to the, the panelists uh, before they begin their talk. So I'd like to start with sharing some interesting piece of uh, information with you. So the Prize Atlas of Ethnographic Societies records over 3,814 distinct cultures across the world, you know, which have actually been described by the anthropologists, but we all know that it could be a major underestimate. And uh, we do know how complex the topic of cross-cultural communication is given the vast number of cultures that exists. And we also know how critical it is in order to build trust, especially in an environment where many of us are looking to collaborate with each other, work with each other, and develop it, develop solutions, you know, sitting wherever we are in any part of the world, not necessarily even meeting uh, at times. So in short, when we talk about cross-cultural uh, codes, we're talking about social norms, we're talking about ethical values, traditional customs, belief systems, political systems, artifacts, and even technologies, you know, that could originate in, in a particular region, I won't even call country, you know, so when you say cross cultural, we very often think of it, hey, this is my country, and this is another country, but sometimes we have many cultures, subcultures and countercultures within a single country, which uh, whether we look at or not, they do exist. And uh, if we have to be effective in achieving significant goals, uh, whether they're uh, social, political, community. Uh, uh, I think it's uh, this. This topic is really, really important, and Asia, of course, is one of the uh, the largest ecosystems of cultures. And so, so without taking uh, much time from the 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 schedule that we have, I'd like to very quickly introduce our uh, panelists for today. So I'll give a brief introduction for each and then invite them to uh, give their talk. Uh, start with uh, Dr. Monisa Kadri. Uh, hi, Dr. Monisa, are you there? Yeah, I can, I can see you. Great, thank you. So uh, Dr. Monisa is a media educator teaching journalism and mass communication at the Islamic University of Science and Technology in Kashmir. And her interests include PR, films, social media, and one of her papers on films and religion is actually now part of a syllabi of the Queen Mary University of London and the Virginia Commonwealth University. She's also been awarded with many prestigious fellowships like the Copenhagen Florida International University Fellowship in 2021, the Bridge Institute UK Kalinga in 2021 and 2017, the Commonwealth in 2019, the Indo-Global Social Services Sector Media Fellowship, 2012-13. She's also a mentor with the Commonwealth Scholarship Commission in the UK and is collaborating with the Columbia Law School Clinic for a project on education. And uh, Dr. Monisa is also a youth trainer on life skills and leadership, which you will find common in one of our other co-panelists, which I'll introduce in a short while. Our second panelist, for the day on this topic is uh, Tatavik Simonian. She's from Armenia and we've had some wonderful opportunities collaborating with her and participating in a, in a forum in Yerevan a couple of years back. 
Uh, Tatavik is an entrepreneur and an experienced director of communications with a demonstrated history of working in the public relations and communications industry. She has a master of sociology focused on public relations and methods of sociological researchers from the Yerevan State University. She's the co-founder of Spring PR Company, a company she's very proud of, I know. And she's been a consultant on several highly significant projects uh, across industries. Tatavik is a member of the Chartered Institute of Public Relations, London, and is also a global advisory board member of the World Communications Forum Association. Welcome, Tatavik, to the panel today. Next, uh, we've got uh, Nurul Shamsuri, uh, a real dear friend who has been associated with the, the World Communications Forum project since 2014 uh, with us. And she's a passionate educator. Uh, Nurul is actually the founder of Project PLS and Clue to the Zoo. And both of these are passion projects with the mission to give the young people of Malaysia a winning chance for excellence. So this is something which you would find quite interesting in common with uh, Dr. Manisa. She's an educator, international speaker, founder, and a global nomad, as she calls herself. And Nurul has made it her life mission to educate the next generation of youth to fulfill their true potential. Receiving her education in the Malaysia and the Netherlands, Nurul has attended the prestigious summer school of the United Nations World Intellectual Property Organization in Switzerland, the World Trade Institute, University of Bern, and the Europa Institute in Germany. Nurul is also a global advisory board member of the World Communication Forum Association. Welcome, welcome Nurul. Okay, and then we've got uh, Paroma Roy Chaudhary. So Paroma is a communication advocacy and a public affairs professional with over two decades of experience across some of the most prominent global organizations. She's held leadership positions in companies like GE, Hewlett Packard, Airtel, Google, and SoftBank. And currently she's the senior vice president uh, and the head of communications and public affairs at one of the world's largest edtech startups called Baiju's, which is currently valued at about $22 billion. She holds the first class graduate and undergraduate degree from the very prestigious Presidency College in Kolkata and has completed a, a press fellowship at the University of Cambridge, in UK. She loves literature, contemporary Indian art, music and films, and a very keen observer of politics. So you can be rest assured she understands culture from a very, very fine lens. So welcome, welcome Paroma to the, uh, to the discussion today. Okay, great. So we're going to start with uh, Dr. Monisa Kadri. And she has an interesting topic, which is looking beyond the lens of ethnocentrism, prejudices, and stereotypes mm -hmm. for cross-cultural exchanges, perspectives from South Asia. Over to you, Dr. Manisa. Uh, thank you so much, Saurabh. Uh, you've been really generous uh, with all of us. And uh, greetings to everyone, including the uh, amazing and brilliant fellow speakers that we have had during the summit and uh, you know remarkable moderators who've been doing a wonderful job i this is indeed an honor for me to be speaking today during the summit and uh, i'm thankful to the president uh, mr maxim behar and uh, ms uh, meena nazari and their entire team for inviting me and all their efforts that they have put in um today we our panel is looking at uh, the cross-cultural communication. And uh, my idea is to look at the barriers in terms of ethnocentrism and um, stereotypes and their perspectives from so South Asia. Uh, we understand that uh, you know, culture is seen as a very complex phenomenon. And uh, it's been noted that the beauty of the world lies in the diversity of people. Uh, when the filmmaker Robert Allen said cultural differences should not separate us from each other, but rather cultural diversity should bring in a collective strength because that will benefit the humanity. It was surely about recognizing the intercultural dialogue that needs to be there and also to enrich a cross-cultural understanding of the world. 
so what may appear as differences on a surface level may actually be a bridging catalyst. Um, understanding the culture could be a difficult and a daunting task. We know that. And even when we are living a certain culture, we are part of a phenomenon. Uh, since we know that it's a very nuanced and uh, its manifestation is reflected in different aspects. And if one claims to know one's own culture, I believe even that is not possible. Um, and then not to talk about a foreign culture. So if you look at the uh, you know image there, it's the cultural iceberg which was put forward by Edward Hall, who kind of put down an analogy between an iceberg and culture and uh, just 10% of the culture is actually visible in terms of the behaviors that are reflected or the practices that we see on ground. Uh, but the rest remains beneath the surface. It remains hidden from the eye. That's how culture is. It's, it's a complex phenomenon. It's a layered phenomenon which needs to be understood. Um, so on a pragmatic level, even though people across different cultures communicate constantly, and more so with the platformization we have been talking about social media today. A platformization of culture, of communication, of uh, interactions, even for the global uh, public relations. This does not necessarily mean that the human civilization has mastered the art of communication or is implementing an evolved sense of understanding and empathy while engaging in a cross-cultural communication. Um, And while some cultures, you know, they took on a dominant position vis-a-vis -vis the global landscape, um, mm -hmm. cultures such as Asian and African culture, for example, are yet to be understood holistically in their true sense. Uh, we, we can say at multiple levels, different barriers exist. And uh, these including anxiety, assuming that all cultures have to be alike, they have to be similar. Uh, ethnocentrism or stereotypes and things like prejudice or nonverbal communication not being clear to, at a global global level and even language becoming a barrier at times. A fact that cannot be overlooked here is the linguistic diversity. For example, just India, it presents such a diverse uh, image in terms of languages, the plurality. It has 22 official languages, around 121 languages, which are spoken by 10,000 or more people, and hundreds of languages or dialects are spoken as mother tongue. Uh, and out of the globally established languages, living languages, which are 7,099, South Asia is one of the most linguistically diverse areas within the world, which has four families of four huge families of languages, which are around 650. And uh, look at this richness and the need to know this uh, linguistic diversity. So when we go beyond the uh, verbal cues, we look at the non-verbal communication, but then non-verbal communication is not a universal phenomenon. A gesture in our culture may have one meaning and it may have a completely different meaning in another culture. It may be opposite. Um, so grasping linguistic traditions is something that is quite significant, but it may not be possible. Even when we look at Google translation, for example, uh, it is flawed when we talk about prominent languages uh, from the world. And uh, then not to talk about the hundreds of dialects which are existing. Uh, so this language barrier is the most common obstacle against an effective cross-cultural understanding. And uh, languages, their grammar, their uh, you know their semantics, syntax, or uh, the kind of literature which is available in those languages, and the oral traditions which you know every culture has to offer, they are at the core of these cultures. So, for drawing any concrete cultural comparisons, which is the cross-cultural communication, eventually, you know, we have to have, uh, and we, we should not be making any assumptions, even if we are making assumptions, they can be more of an informed assumptions. So we have to kind of maybe learn somehow to navigate through these languages. It's not possible to learn all the languages, but having rich digital repositories or correct, accurate uh, dictionaries available may somehow bring them to the world. Um, now, when the walls are kind of drawn up between communities due to linguistic barriers, among other things like stereotyping, um, 
stereotyping is 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 a generalization. It's a phenomenon wherein you generalize about a community, about a population. And stereotyping of cultures has been happening for a number of years and it, it will go on. And you know, for the longest time, uh, terms like global south or um, uh, third world have been acceptably used or maybe referred to for South Asia or Asia for that matter with little or no offense at all, we have been accommodating it. And uh, there has been a consistent othering of the sorts about South Asia to speak, uh, so as to say. For example, on different levels like lifestyle, like eating habits, like gender roles or freedom of expression. You know, a well-known joke that goes around the world is uh, they say that we mean 10 a.m. British time or we mean 10 a.m. American time and not uh, South Asian time or Indian time, which means that we are late. Uh, we, we may agree to that to some extent. We are generally late to some extent. Maybe this one holds true, but not every stereotype is, you know, acceptable uh, or to be generalized otherwise. Uh, and they generally tend to have a regressive uh, nature to them. And the stereotypes about colored people, about ethnic people, about let's say Muslims or Mongolite features have hindered celebration of cultures uh, as equals. And even positive stereotypes for that matter. For example, uh, a stereotype may exist in America that all Asians are good at maths or computers. That's not accurate. We belong to social sciences or humanities or arts and we can be equally good at those. Um, so an, a stereotypical iconography of Indian characters, for example, in Hollywood has been happening and has been going on for ages. Um, it's been there. Or uh, then we come to a phenomenon of uh, ethnocentrism. How does stereotyping happen and why does it happen? Which lens are we using when we refer to certain cultures or countries this way? Is that of ethnocentrism? Uh, that accords a sense of superiority of the sorts to one's own culture or the co-cultures. And you tend to look down upon other cultures. Um, it has been happening uh, and Nazi supremacy is one big example which proved to be a fatal uh, you know result to, for, for the for the uh, for 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 the world and uh, this top down way of communication of exchanges has for long established a western hegemony with regards to other cultures and has led to cultural relativism is when you kind of look at other cultures from your own culture, you, from the lens of your culture. You compare their culture and you accord value to it and you assign value to it based on your own culture because you feel that your culture is good enough or it's superior and you assign the value of inferiority to other cultures. And uh, which is so predominant, uh, especially in a South Asian uh, you know, perspective. You know, how did eating with cutlery, for example, get rationalized as against eating with hand, for example, which is happening in South Asian cultures so much so, or uh, driving on the wrong, wrong side of the road, which may not be so, uh, you know, fatal or which may not be so harmful, so as to say, or, uh, and then a reverse ethnocentrism has been happening from our side as well. And it's more like a grid one. It's not just emanating from one culture, it's coming from different countries. And they're together having a perception about some, uh, some society. Like for example, having societal judgments about things like how marriages are not so successful in the Western world, or uh, people are not so religious as South Asians are. So it's important to avoid interpreting other indi others in individual behaviors through your own cultural lens. Uh, as I said earlier, it could be a danger. It can translate into a dangerous manifestation at the end of the day, and we could be causing harm more than the good. Um, uh, for now, for uh, you know, in terms of engaging in a very effective cross-cultural exchanges. Uh, in this complex life form, which is culture, certain strategic, flexible framework of, uh, you know, different ideas may kind of help. And these include cultural sensi sen sensitivity. We are usually accustomed to what is familiar to us or what is acceptable to us as norms and as practices. And at times, we may not be that sensitive to a cultural 
practice which is away from that of ours. And um, like, like how, for example, uh, people from this particular region, they're very particular about their uh, religious rituals or the practices that go on. Uh, for example, like covering of head or not wearing footwear inside a certain space, which is regarded as sacred or, uh, you know, observing silence at times or eating with the right hand, for example. These are concrete manifestations of cultural differences and at times, if not respected, can act as greater barriers. And um, then recognizing cultural differences, as I said earlier, there are differences more than the similarities. And the uh, essential fact is that a proactive response to these differences would definitely help in uh, better intercultural communication taking place across the world. And appreciating differences in Asia, for example, one of the best selling authors, um, Kaylin Gao, and I quote, she gave a tip about Asian portrayals through literature and media. Uh, so that it's not people are not confusing different cultures from Asia. And she says that if you write about Asian culture, be accurate about what is the difference between Chinese, Japanese, Korean, Malaysian, Thai, Taiwanese, Indonesian, and many individual Asian countries. For the rest of the world, it may seem all Asian, but these are different cultures. And there is a lot of diversity and plurality even within every single culture existing here. And uh, she goes on, while there may be similarities, the differences in culture will provide an authentic portrayal and not a westernized version. Also important is the cultural empathy that entails understanding each other's feelings or uh, what is it coming from, the roots, the cultural roots uh, behind these feelings and being aware of our emotional state of mind. You know, an emotionally uh, intelligent uh, individual can easily Dr. overcome Dr. cultural contradictions. You may encounter some practice which may be opposed to what you are used to, but then if you're emotionally intelligent enough and you're able to respect and respond to a situation which is quite sensitive and quite empathetic, probably it may lead to a better and an effective kind of a communication space. And in addition to empathy, cultural inclusiveness, uh, Dr. Kadri, that uh, cultural parity of the sorts um, would exist and gaining competence in different foreign languages, as well as nonverbal skills, along with equipping the, with equipping generations with excellent cross-cultural <clears throat> communication skills, which also includes listening for that matter, or, uh, you know, will, or, or... May, uh, I, may I interrupt you, Dr. Kadri? Uh, observe the non-verbal gestures that are being offered so that they are receptive, they're responsive, and they are proactive in terms of engaging with different cultures. We are now in at the time when we are going be, beyond demanding cultural assimilation which meant that people from a minority culture had to transform into a majority culture so that's not happening that uh, now that much so acculturation is happening and mixed cultures and plurality uh, is happening and not the melting pot uh, of cultures we no longer want cultures to melt into a pot and uh, we no longer want cultures to disappear so thank you so much everyone and it was really really a pleasure being here and uh, listening to everyone thank you so much uh dr dr kadri thanks a lot for your talk and introduction i do realize that uh, i was trying to interrupt you to keep keep the time and we've actually um, lost a little bit of that but i'm going to request the other speakers to maybe uh uh, keep to about eight minutes. I think she's not able to hear us. That may be part of the reason. Uh, are you able to hear us now? Okay. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank, thank you very much. So I'm going to request uh, the rest of the speakers to uh, keep their talk to about uh, eight, uh, eight to nine minutes, not longer than that, so that we have enough time for a short Q&A. And uh, I'm going to next invite uh, Tatavik and if you can keep it even shorter, great. I mean, just get to the, the main points as quickly as you can, because we do have a keynote to cover, which we missed a uh, short while ago. Uh, Tashvik, over to you for your uh, uh, business perspective from Armenia you know, on, on the topic. Oops. Thanks, Sora. Um, so I, I will try to keep the timing. 
First of all, let me extend my sincere regards to all participants and organizers of Asia Communication Summit. It's my absolute pleasure to participate in this panel and present the Armenian perspective. Uh, of course, I will present the global coronavirus crisis and the business perspective from Armenia. But before uh, coming to my topic, I'd like to say that as Armenia um, is in a crossroad between Asia and Europe. Uh, we as a PR agency and as a nation are very involved in various cross-cultural communications. We are cooperating with more than 20 global PR agencies all over the world. And especially after coronavirus crisis, we decided to have um, memorandums with various PR agencies, uh, starting from Africa, in Europe, in UK, in uh, United Arab Emirates. So uh, it's very interesting that uh, Spring PR started its, um, when we were founded. So we started a very interesting project with uh, Estonian PR agency uh, called Corporate PR. And we get two planes with various um, cultural people, with bands, uh, theater, painters, students, everybody to visit uh, the capital of Estonia, Tallinn, and to open for Armenia, Estonian culture. And also we had a back uh, planes and they are coming to Armenia, visiting Yerevan, and it's a very global cross-cultural project. So we have this, and um, I would like to say that if somebody in this community would like to repeat this, so we have a huge experience and we are ready to make this kind of interesting projects because yes, I do believe that uh, communication specialists, communication professional, professionals are those who are opening new cultures, who are opening new interesting perspectives for their countries. And um, of course, when I'm coming to my topic, um, I will say that um, organizations all over the world have reacted to the changes brought by the pandemic into the lying phase. Some wisely, some others less so, but um, let's say when we are talking about crisis, uh, certain types of predictable crisis are known to be possible, but we don't know whether they will happen, and if so, where and when. So, yeah, as um, maybe you know, the great Sam Black uh, defined them as known unknown crises. And in different countries, depending on culture, context, and mentality of society, organizations have reacted to the difficult new reality in a different ways. And I would like to present the typology uh, given by uh, me and my colleagues, Navar Melkonyan and Mariam Safarian. So we had an interesting paper and the research on this how Armenian businesses have reacted to the challenges caused by the crisis. But it's very interesting to share this and then get a feedback. So how they um, acted in your countries in, uh, in the same period of time. So we have the first um, uh, communication time. We say like three wise monkeys. In this um, crisis, many organizations took up a strategy to build a defensive Chinese wall, let's say. They prefer to stay silent, not responding to the crisis in any way, to save financial and human resources, and to try to overcome the situation with minimal losses, of course. So they dived underwater, as we say, until the danger is over. And these organizations didn't even take advantage of strengthening the trust with their audience by being next to them in a difficult and unstable situation to provide support. Such strategy, of course, is not particularly purposeful for those organizations which have been active in the past before the crisis. Their long, inconvenient, and unjustified silence could jeopardize their relations with both external and internal audiences. So this is the first type we had during the crisis. Then we, the second uh, uh, model, let's say, um, we said image is nothing, trust is everything. 
uh, as in various cultures and in communication is very important. So these kind of organizations try to be as flexible as Harry Hardy, we say, not burning in the fire or drawing in water, but benefiting from the situation. And um, uh, however, their unconsolidated activity was often uh, criticized by the audience who accused them of receiving dividends from and exporting the topic and uh, talking more than acting. So um, the third type was, uh, as we called it, just do it. Um, lots of organization um, act more than talk during the crisis. And uh, this strategy has guided those organizations um, which have relevant activities and services and are able to meet the needs and expectations of their audiences. Uh, but the uh, Tatovic, I'm, I'm going to request you to wrap up maybe in the next 90 seconds uh if, if that's okay yes uh, yeah thank you and my apologies yeah, to interrupt you yeah. okay and um when uh, talking about the um uh, how business acting in um, various situation we have the communications that are uh, the, the companies that um, they are sharing and caring and uh, organizations that care for and listen to the needs of their public follow and support them in a changing context and create comfort, they became leaders. And their public is continuously informed and confident that the organizations are in control of the situation and have plans to urgently respond to it. And as you know, um, uh, Edelman Trust Barometer made a research in uh, various parts of the world in 2021. And the research uh, said that business more trusted than government. So this was in Armenia too, in our uh, society too, because very often the organizations focus on primary vulnerable groups, the isolated, the infected. So uh, brands with well-established corporate social responsibility policies, which implement various programs in different areas in response to the needs of the audience have increased the share of care, expanding the directions of their programs and the scope of beneficiaries. Uh, according to our observations, when talking about pandemic, uh, it's very important to share with you that science and technology development and science and technology became a top public agenda. And this reflected both in political and private discourse. Also, there are various initiatives competing to take a lead the science popularization and raising public awareness on, on how technologies work, uh, what is the technology, what is science, how to understand uh, the importance, etc, etc. So um, also, I would like to say that uh, this kind of, um, let's say, uh, crises came to prove that um, uh, and also the global pandemic was a litmus test which draws clear academic lines between communication and PR and other disciplines and communication professionals were among the first to respond to the situation and started searching for new approaches, more effective ways and formats for communicating with the audience. And it's very important to mention that uh, that uh, those agencies, those PR, PR specialists who are involved in various professional networks, for example, in WCFA, International PR Association, Charter, etc. So it, it is very helpful because we are calling our colleagues in other countries and asking for help, asking how they are acting in such or that situation, what to do, sharing with them our um, let's say, um, uh, interesting cases and getting uh, feedback on how to react in these times. So um, coming yeah. back on saving time. Yeah, so yeah I, I think so. Yeah, I request you to maybe give your final comments, maybe. Yes. Uh, yeah. 
there are lots of things to discuss and of course we will have a q and day we can share some insights after this summit but i think that it's very important to have this kind of gatherings professional networking and summits and um thank you um, thank you thank you very much yeah yeah Thanks a lot, Tatwik. I know it's a little bit unfair when you're very passionate about your subject, and my apologies for that. Uh, I think Paroma, you have a question for her. Uh, uh, sort of, yeah. I'm really, uh, I'm, thank you very much, and and thank you to the organizers. This is really wonderful. I have a request. I have a call to get to. So I if I can go now, and then I'll promise okay. to do exactly eight minutes or less. And then you can go to the fourth speaker and I'll immediately drop out after that. I'm sorry. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just take uh, Nurul's permission once. Nurul, are you okay with that? Uh, yeah, it's fine. Uh, yeah. Right. No Thank problem. You very much. Yeah. I'm, I'm really Thank sorry. You. I didn't right. know that That's this fine. call was supposed to be done. And uh, sure. just to complete uh, my introduction, two very important things which I'm very proud of. One is that I serve on a board of CXXO, which is a female founder focused fund. And I do all communications for them. This is pro bono. And I'm really proud of that. And also, I teach communication and brand in a very well-known private university called Shivnadar. And even at the risk of blowing my own trumpet, my old classes are uh, like 4.7 plus on a scale of five. And so clearly, communications is one topic which interests everyone. And, and cross-cultural communication is very, very interesting. I have walked across continents, so I'm just going to do, uh, just go to my experiences and not really keep it academic, also short. So what is culture? Culture is something that shapes our value and identity. And, you know, depends on factors like race, ethnicity, language, gender, uh, geography, uh, your country of origin. And why is cross-cultural communication important? Because we live in a global world, very obviously. And uh, I mean, to get to business, new business opportunity, get to get to new markets, to get to new job, you want to need to understand the cultural uh, nuances. And, uh, and the typical points where we tend to, uh, you know, stumble, if I may say, is how to take decisions, how to resolve conflicts, how do you deal with disclosure norms, how do you correct some misinformation. This is very typical minefield of culture, which despite being very qualified and having all the hard skills, best of people stumble. When I was at HP, the HP did that CEO Mark Hurd went into, walked into a Japanese meeting with a Starbucks cup in his hands and uh, he lost the deal because it was meant decoded as disrespect. So concrete situations like this can make or break a business deal and a, a marketing deal, or most importantly, your career. And um, just to give you a couple of examples, all of us have worked or, or at least have dealt with West Europe or American colleague. Europe and the US are fairly high context cultures. We don't need verbal clues all the time. The non-verbal clues there or situational clues are very, very important. What do I mean by that? Body language, eye contact, tone of voice, posture. These are sometimes more important than what you're actually saying in a high context culture. Whereas uh, not so high context culture like Asia, Latin America, Middle East, we depend a lot on the spoken word. But we work in a global workplace, right? So we let me just focus the next five or six minutes only on nonverbal clues because everybody's covered or going to cover the other aspects. Eye contact. In the US, eye contact is normal natural, you're expected to maintain an eye contact with your colleague, irrespective of the gender, while you do a business communication or any discussion. In Asia, in Japan, or sometimes in China, if you stare your boss in the face, it is considered to be disrespectful if done over a period of time. Also sometimes in India, in South Asia. 
and uh, in Middle East, and I've actually experienced this with due apology to all my Middle Eastern colleagues, uh, in mixed workplaces in Saudi Arabia, you cannot look a man in the eye and talk. It can be misconstrued, misrepresented, which is not your intention. Same goes for body language and attire. If you are, I'm a woman, and even if I'm a high-ranking executive, I have to wear appropriate clothing and sometimes a headscarf. It, if I don't do that, what I'm wearing is going to overtake what I'm seeing. In Japan, you have to be formally dressed all the time. Even in Google, where uh, you know everybody dresses in casual clothes, including founders, Google Tokyo was the only office when men came in dark suits. And 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 uh, the women wore formal clothing, and we had to. And some so attire can be extremely important in the US in banking or finance. If you're wearing anything other than dark gray, black, or navy blue, uh, you stand out. These are very small things, but it can make a huge amount of difference. Tone of voice. Again, in high context cultures, uh, a, a booming tone of voice, confident, it often denotes confidence. It often denotes control over, over your audience or your medium. In, a Japan, in Japan or in even China, you try to have a booming voice or in India also in some parts, uh, it is considered rude. So what can decode confidence in one part of the geography? can decode overconfidence in another part of geography. So when you are a communicator, and I can go on and on, tone of voice, the color that you wear, I mean, this color is, is my favorite. In, in India, the car, color orange is the color of an ascetic, a monk. In, in the US, it's the color of a prison uniform. Very few people wear orange like I'm wearing to a workplace. So small things, white is a color of festivity of the new bride in, in the US. White is the color of widowhood in India. You do not wear black or white to a wedding of a colleague. So what I'm saying is that, yeah, as communicators, please understand the cultural context you operate in. How to do that? Ask questions. Don't be rude. Ask questions. Write things down. Go slow. Repeat. Do not use local, intensely local expressions. My US colleagues used to say that, you know, this is a lemon. I never understood what it was till I decoded a lemon is something that doesn't work, right? And in India, it's a fruit. So again, I mean, you know, when we I first started working in the U.S., Indians are notorious at by interrupting other people, and uh, and there. Okay, as as an Indian, I'm, as an Indian, I'm going to interrupt, interrupt you here, yes. yeah. <laughs> because so, we okay. we have about forty five yeah. seconds for you to yeah, wrap up. Yeah, sixty maybe, and I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, That's okay. So essentially, learn, adapt, ask questions, do not. Uh, I mean, override, uh, do not impose your own values and styles and, and uh, you know, ask communicators. And more importantly, when you're training spokespeople, which we all have to do, it's very, very important that you train them uh, in and keeping the cultural context in mind. The best of CEOs, I worked with Eric Schmidt, and that's another story we'll I'll keep for another day. But I'll give you the Mark Hurd example. I mean, it was just not done. His people did not brief him. But it's always good to try out local food in a limited context. In one of the GE for GE chairman, his water used to come to the US from the US on India visits. Fortunately, that happens. It doesn't happen now. So what I'm saying is that in cross-cultural communication, sometimes nonverbal communication 
uh, 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 that clues are far more important than the spoken word. As communicators, we must take note of that, train ourselves, adapt ourselves, and make sure our spokespeople and colleagues are trained in the same way. If you're sensitive, if you're open, and if you are humorous, you can navigate many, many situations which can be very tricky. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Paroma, for those wonderful examples. I think lots to take back. And uh, so we're not going to keep you away from your dinner, but if you can stay back for another five, seven minutes, Nurul no, comes no, in I next. And she's a... Not sure. dinner. I have a call. I'm sorry. But oh, I, I see. All right. Sure. Call. That's fine. Yeah. 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 So yeah. sorry. Again, sorry. No, and thank you very much, Saurav and others. And me now. Yeah. You're welcome. And and next comes, you know, the, the last speaker for our panel, you know, the, the very, very uh, dynamic and enigmatic Nurul. And I'm Hi, sure Sarah. she's got something interesting as well to, to conclude our panel. But you're going to take five, six minutes. And <laughs> I, I said all those amazing things so that you take lots of time. And, I don't uh, mind, to be honest, because I feel that everybody already touched upon things that, that um, it's a lot of overlapping with what I want to say. So I feel like with the fact that it's overlapping, meaning I'm on the right track. So <laughs> it's not going to take very long. Um, when it comes to, okay. Hello, everybody. Um, it's good. It's great to be here. Uh, thank you for having me. It, it's six minutes. I don't know what to do. Okay, never mind. I'm just going to go really quick. Right. Okay. Um, I have a small presentation to share with you guys about, um, let me see if I can move this. Yeah. Can you see my screen? Yes, perfectly visible, though we can see. Thank you for listening. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Already wrapped up. Okay. Okay, so, there we go. Yeah. I'm going to touch uh, because uh, Ms. Paroma already touched upon on um, body language. And I think one of the speakers previously already touched upon a very, com uh, you know, very complete set of uh, cross cultural communications. I'm going to touch only on empathy and tolerance. Um, basically, barriers in cross cultural communications. Are, are all of these things, you know, ethnocentrism, stereotyping, psychological barriers, language barriers, geographical distance and values. And the, re, the, the result of, uh, of communication breakdown in cross-cultural um, communications are basically, you know, misunderstanding, lack of trust, inefficiency, delay, stress, and low morale. And I think the topic of cross-cultural communication is very interesting, um, very, important because it has always been a problem. And it's also um, put that in the mix of the situation where we are right now. We are not, at least for Malaysia, not completely out of the woods yet from COVID and all the uncertainties, the volatilities. So you mix cross-cultural cross communication complexity with, with everything else that we are feeling at this moment. I think it's, it, it's an, it's a recipe for disaster if we didn't get it right. So um, other speakers, like for example, Paroma, Ms. Paroma, I love your point on body language is so important. And what I wanna talk about, one of the antidote for, for this is basically uh, empathy. And I'm, I'm a big fan of empathy. I teach empathy in my class and I feel that there's a lot of problems in the world that we can solve if we actually have empathy towards each other. And um, the definition of empathy, basically, um, it's a long, long definition here, but basically the action of understanding, being aware, being sensitive, and vicariously experiencing the feeling thoughts of other people. Empathy and, and is a contradictory of sympathy. Empathy meaning that we put ourselves in the shoes of another person. So with all the barriers, um, applying empathy in communication, meaning that when we are communicating with people that is not the same culture as us, we do have a responsibility to become consciously aware, not only on our messages, not only on how we communicate to other people, also we have to be sensitive on how they may perceive our messages as well. And while I believe that it's impossible to learn every detail about unfamiliar culture, I cannot, like you just mentioned in the beginning, it was 3000 culture. It's impossible to learn all of them, but making conscious effort to at least try, you know, there's a, there's a um, term that I really love that I learned today 
uh, from the, the first speaker is cultural iceberg. You know, we only learn 10% from other people's culture, but if we actually put a little bit more effort in learning other people's culture, we could actually put ourselves in a much better position in understanding other people's culture um, and how to communicate with them. So for the context of Malaysia, Malaysia is a melting pot of so many different cultures, you know, just like India, just like other countries in Asia, we are so diverse. And um, as a country that is learning and developing for the longest time, Malaysia exists by tolerating each other, you know, tolerance, it's just you understand other people and you do not want to disturb the, the status quo. But for Malaysia, we should actually move from just tolerant to feeling more empathetic so that we can exist much better as a multicultural country. So for me, I do believe that uh, when it comes to cross-cultural communications, one of the uh, one of the biggest thing that we could apply when to avoid suspicions, to avoid misunderstanding, is basically to apply empathy in the in the in the in the uh, in the mix. So, yes, thank you for listening. Six minutes, yay! That's incredible, incredible timing, and and thanks, <laughs> thanks a lot. <laughs> I think you touched upon a very important uh, topic to end your. Session. How do I stop sharing? Oh, stop sharing. Uh, yeah. Okay. And. So uh, I, I can see that uh, nobody's put in questions, and but I'd like to maybe put out a question to all the panelists, and maybe anybody could choose to respond. You know, so uh, during one of the parts, uh, Paroma, you spoke about uh, understanding cultural context, cultural codes, and asking questions. I think you put a lot of emphasis on asking questions. So I have a question for all the panelists. So what are some of these cultural questions to really ask? when you're trying to assimilate yourself and trying to uh, understand cultural context. So what kind of questions can one ask? You know, I think that's my question to all of you. Uh, you're on mute, Paroma. Very briefly, I would like to really know the dress code. Mm -hmm. I mean, you okay. know, people really trip, trip up on that because people okay. dress so differently. Uh, I had to dress for a Saudi Arabian delegation with Prince Salman. And uh, again, that's a separate story, but I learned my lesson. And then mm -hmm. I came rightly dressed for the rest of the trip. Interesting. So, so that's one really, question. Yeah, attire. Yeah. Okay. okay, great. And let's take one, one question each from the other co panelists. Uh, uh, Tata, uh, Dr. Monisa Nurul, that order. Okay. I will ask about the cuisine, uh, what they love, what they prefer, what they drink, what they eat. So it's very important to understand the culture, I think. Interesting. Yeah. And food is important, very, very important part of culture. So yes. Uh, Dr. Monisa. Yeah, uh, I think it's very important to signify that you're really curious to know about the culture. Mm. So that curiosity has to be you know shown and uh, also whenever we are trying to answer any question you know you, everybody even when we you know ask our students or we train that you know when you are sitting in an interview there are leg legal <laughs> questions and then there are illegal questions but answer the intent so what is the intention so if you're clear with your intention yeah. while you're asking that question the chances of getting more responses are there. For example, yeah. one question could be, uh, if I am in, in a certain setting and I really don't want to behave in a manner which would go against their norms and they would not be happy mm -hmm. with my behavior, maybe I could have some uh, you know, uh, instructions from them beforehand. I can ask them, what should I be doing in this situation? What should I be wearing in mm. this situation? So that they are clear. And, you know, often what happens is that in that situation, people try to over help and they'll try to okay. give you all the sets of instructions. Fair point. Great, great points. Uh, Nurul, what, is, what kind of questions should one ask if you're trying to assimilate yourself in a new cultural environment? Oh. What kind of questions? Actually, I, I really like what uh, Dr. Moniza say. you know. Actually, for me we should not limit question that we should ask because mm -hmm. we because how can we how can we learn that there are sensitive questions and there are not sensitive questions but if we approach the question 
in the place of curiosity i'm really curious mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. maybe apologize in advance if you feel like the question mm -hmm. is a little bit offensive then you're like Good okay point. you know i i think this is a little bit offensive but can you tell me if, why did you guys do things this way because i don't yeah. understand then i think that's fine so i think that's there's no limit on the question to ask when it comes to understanding other culture if you ask me i think great points i think uh, you 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 put it back on empathy and sensitivity to uh, and while being curious as well mm -hmm. wonderful uh, i'd like to thank all uh, my wonderful co-panelists uh, four wonderful women for from four different parts of asia uh, thank you so much for joining in and contributing with your amazing knowledge and experiences and i'm going to now uh, hand over the mic to uh, dr mespa uh, to take on the rest of the proceedings thank you very much thank you all uh, we are just having uh, one more presentation from me uh, he started but got disconnected so we are moving back to that presentation before we conclude our amazing forum. Me, back to you. Welcome back. Hi, uh, hi everyone. I'm sorry about the disruption. You know, when I, I was about to start, everything just stopped. So, uh, thank you for your patience. Uh, actually, um, my my uh, topic is quite uh, broad uh, for. Uh, 15 minutes, but uh, you know, I'll, I'll be sharing my perspective from you know, uh, like a PR uh, practitioner. I, I I've been working in in the business for like um, uh, 25 years. I started um, with the government, and then I, I moved to work for the private sector, uh, working in you know various um, companies like a, a British oil uh, company, then an American uh, tobacco company, and another American soft drink uh, company and an American uh, alcohol company. So, you know, um, the, the, the matter of trust, transparency, and truth uh, are fundamental to uh, the success of, you know, such a highly controversial uh, industries. And I just would like to share with you how, how much we dealt with, you know, the lack of uh, trust and, you know, the skepticism in terms of transparency and so the concern about truth uh, which came from our stakeholders when it comes to the conversations of, you know, very difficult industries. Because my understanding is that PR is not all about dealing with, you know, um, you know, opportunities. But uh, from time to time, we have to deal a lot with concerns and questions and, and skepticism. So uh, from the perspective of a practitioner, uh, I just share with you, you know, um, my, my, my thinking in terms of, you know, uh, how we're gonna see the correlation between language because the language is so important to us as uh, communicators, as PR uh, professionals, and how uh, it applies uh, in terms of you know reality. And this is very interesting picture that I saw uh, from my you know um, my work uh, you know my job practicing uh, experience. You know, I think it's an example from from you know the Oxford the definition of trust. You know firm belief in the reliability, truth, ability, or strength of someone or something. And you know, the very first example, Oxford refers to which relation have to be built on trust. So you see a very clear, you know, apparent connection between trust and relations. And then we, we came to the next point, which is the, the trust building model. And you know, there are a few, few key elements there. And if you, connect between, you know, the two columns, you're gonna see a lot of correlation there. You know, reliability, you see, we have reliability in terms of, uh, you know, building, um, trust building model. When it comes to truth, we have integrity, we have competence. When it comes to ability, we have management, we have strategy, we have development. And when it comes to strength, we have your knowledge, something like that. So actually, the language defines, you know, the meaning of trust. But when it comes to, you know, execution of our profession, it comes exactly the same way. And and let me come to the next the, the next point, which is which is the the spectrum of you know of different stakeholders when it comes to the conversation about 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 trust. And you know, I've been spending all my career, twenty five years, working with those bubbles. 
and and you know i a question came up, came up to my my mind uh, who trust whom is it fair that only we the pr people are must be trustworthy to the other people are out there and they are there to judge us or not and they they are there just tell us what to do uh, to be you know, a successful pr person i mean we are coming to a different stage in, in, in our uh, history of you know the, the professional development already. Uh, we are seeing what we call a shared value um, idea. So anybody in the spectrum should be equally trustworthy. And, and I you know I, I'm going to go out there and promote that kind of you know thinking. We should take you know the, the driving seat. You know, we don't have to be sit in to be seated in the you know the back seat for somebody to, to drive us forward. And and today, when it comes to you know like uh, very difficult industry like tobacco or alcohol or even you know the soft drink, uh, we we have a difficult time bringing to the table this, you know the equality, you know the sh the same share of voice. But you know by having again. Uh, the trust of you know the sources of information we put on the table. How much we help them to solve the problem, you know, with the government, with you know the civil society, with the community, with the media. I think trust uh, could be built over the time. Um, let, let me take very a few a few quick you know uh, case studies. Uh, trust can be built, but can be lost easily. And let me, let me take let me take you back to a very you know a reason a reason example you know a very bad uh, crisis happened to a big British oil company you know that company has been famous for its you know high safety standard for like decades and all of a sudden you know an explosion you know just just happened in 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 you know in the Gulf of Mexico and the, the whole trust that that company built over over the years just collapsed and you know I, I was part of that organization for 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 a few years and i felt i felt very sorry about that happened to that company but my belief is that they will come back very very soon because they have they have high standard of trust that they are wanting to retrieve from that accident and you know i believe in the kind of you know the quality of the leadership they have around around the globe uh, that can you know drive the trust agenda uh, forward or, you know, like another example, trust can be built, uh, but it could be unachievable if, you know, the kind of um, messaging you bring out there is not relevant. I take, for example, you know, a tobacco, American tobacco company, they just introduced a campaign called Unsmoke. Uh, you know, they, they want people to stop smoking. And, you know, they, they, they invited me to, 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 you know, to that uh, advisory board to help them you know, drive that Unsmoke uh, message forward. And I'm sorry, I, I didn't make it happen because, you know, it was not relevant to our people because they wanted to switch to, you know, the new generation of uh, tobacco, which is, you know, heat not burn, no smoke, just, you know, just air, just, you know, like the new way of smoking. And, and for, for, for the people out there, it's not relevant. So the trust was not, uh, you know, achievable to them. And, you know, that's a very bad example, but a good example too at the same time. Or another example, like, you know, um, an American something company. I respect the company a lot because I, I worked for them for years. And they want they, there was a time they they told people to you know to drink to drink and take exercise at the same time to keep you know the balanced diet and everything. But that messaging was not successful because the company was criticized for you know pushing the excuses to their consumers. And it was you know, very tough decades of you know fighting back and forth between you know the scientists between the you know the general public between the company on how to build you know trust in their brand and finally they gave up by you know introducing another concept which is you know choice we have a collection of you know have a portfolio of different products of choice so you may have tea you may have water you don't have to take you know high calorie beverages if you don't have that that need and i think that is the new beginning for them to gain back trust from, you know, very critical audience. You know, I have a few examples, but, you know, from the practical uh, perspective, we have a lot of examples out there on how to build trust and how to be, to be, you know, not having the ability to have trust from, you know, very tough and controversial, you know, audience out there. So, yeah. Two minutes. Two minutes. Okay. I'll move very quickly. The same, the same approach with, you know, transparency, you know, 
Cambridge define you know transparency as the quality of being done in an open way without secrets. And then you look at the you know the model on, on, on the right hand side, we have a high correlation between you know the language we are using every day and the model that we exercise. We, we do you know, we take into action every day. We have you know the, the, the few key elements of you know transparency uh, to to be successful you know uh, in the way we do our business: motivation, accuracy, credibility, clarity, relevance, uh, stakeholder participation, disclosure. They are there in the definition of Cambridge that came out like you know like half a century ago. So again, very interesting fact to see. And the next one. You know, this is this is for me is very um, key question to ask ourselves. Does transparency mean naive openness? You know, sometimes transparency means attitude, the readiness to join the conversation, to build into the conversation, to share the same concern. And I think we don't have to disclose everything because we need to comply with you know agreement of you know non-disclosure. We have we need you know to take care of you know sensitive information. We are in PR, so we need to be sensitive of how to open you know the transparency to people without you know going into a problem. So that is a quick quick take from from my perspective. And and the next one, um, yeah. Before I come to uh, the last slide, truth. We all know, you know, with, with our dictionary, everyone agrees that you know it's very complex uh, terminology, and, and there are a few, you know, analogies saying uh, that is truth in wine because only when people are drunk, you know, they tell the truth. We can be drunk every day to tell people the truth, right? Because we are serious people. But you know what I'm trying to say is that truth sometimes controversial, and we need to be sticking to some principle there. You know, uh, what we define truth in a proper way that not to hurt people or to bring you know um, a reality to a um, you know extreme end of end of the conversation. And let me end with a very um, classic model, which is the zero moment of truth. This is a classic, you know, sales and marketing uh, model. You know, from the point of stimulus uh, to you know the point people you know call around, double check with people they know. You know, go to the social media, go to the internet to check information about a product before they have the first you know moment of truth, which is the you know the experience on the spot. They use it, you know, out there in the shop, and they bring it home, and you know they have the second, second point of experience, and then believe about the truth is is you know fortified before it becomes a habit. It, you know, it it happened the same way with you know engagement with you know stakeholder engagement or relationship building. You know, stimulus is the point we have the introduction of ourselves to the people out there, our organization, our entity. But you know, people who check on us. If we launch, you know, a due diligence on us, and we get a little care who you, who we are, we just want to find out you are good or bad. The moment they find, hey, you are, you are bad. They could be a bad guy, and that's that's a problem. And you have to go back and persuade them, hey, please meet with us. Have give us the first moment of truth, which is the first engagement. You know, see them try to bring to the table a very you know, very very constructive conversation. Bring our good products to see them. Uh, we, we are here to help you. We are here to harm you. And then, if you're lucky, we have the second chance of you know the second moment of truth, which is the experience of working together. You know, collaborating together to make things happen. And you know, by not saying too vague, vague with the meaning behind truth, I would like to use this model. You know, the zero moment of truth to illustrate my point. We can have opportunities to fix turn to fix doubt, to fix, you know, to, to, to get over from, you know, crisis that we, we got before by applying the moment of truth in this model. So thank you very much for listening to my 25 years of experience of fighting out there like a street boy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Meet, and thanks for everyone. Um, this has been a, a wonderful three hour forum, two keynote speakers, uh, eight panelists, three moderators, including myself. So that's very rich. Thanks for bearing with us at uh, the conclusion. Um, I would say public relations and the culture and transparency and the truth and social media, they all mix up together to make a wonderful atmosphere for PR practitioners to design their messages accordingly. Um, 
in the, in the first panel, we talked or we focused on social media, digital age and PR. In the second panel, we focused on culture, cross-cultural communication, wonderful ideas about what culture is, what makes intercultural communication works or fails. Um, I wanna thank the partners of the event. I wanna mention them, give them uh, a tribute. Iran Public Relations Association, our Iranian National Commission for UNESCO Communication Management Club, Public Relations of Tehran District 21 Municipality, Petro Pars Company. Um, if there is any question, we have two delayed questions from the first uh, panel actually. Um, so if anyone wants to ask the questions or repeat a question that we have missed in the first panel, please, we can have final uh, five minutes for any thoughts to be shared before we dismiss. Um, much, Doctor. Uh, I think at uh, this time uh, we have to use our uh, valuable member uh, in WCFA, my and uh, me, uh, about conclusion of our summit. Thank you very much, my please. Mina, Kesham, uh, if you allow me just a couple first bit before our lovely friend and ex co member from Vietnam. Uh, thank you all from the bottom of my heart. Thank you, Mina. Thank you, Hashan. Thank you, Saurabh. Thank you, Ganesh. Thank you, uh, all of our friends for the very, very, uh, Tatev, of course, Tatev Iken, for the very, very uh, interesting participation in this first uh, summit. Three hours, my friends. Three hours. It's a lot of time. And even our global summits, which we organize, uh, in Davos, they don't last more than two hours. So it was very interesting. The questions were very much to the point. And I would like to thank also to the Iranian Public Relations Associations, to the Iranian National Commission of UNESCO, to the Public Relations of Tehran District, and to Petropars Company, which were all of them arranged by Mina. And uh, I really look forward to just to continue this conversation on, on social media, Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, whatever you prefer. But this is a good uh, food for thought and a good uh, base to continue our conversation on social media, mainly on LinkedIn, of course. Uh, we know each other much better. Some of you I meet first time, some of you Hesha meet first time, or Mina and the rest. And um, let's uh, continue this talk in a way that we feel the results of the conversation. The video will be published in a couple of days online. So we will enjoy watching the video. And now I would like to uh, give the floor to Mayan, our good friend from beautiful Vietnam to conclude the, the, the summit. Thank you again. Thank you, Maxim. Thank you, Mina. So thank you everyone who have joining us for more than three hours. And especially until this moment, for the, those last minutes, you still keep uh, listening to our Asia Communication Summit. So let give me my pleasure to sum up, to wrap up our two keynotes and the two panel discussion. So today, uh, thank you, Mr. Kamalipur, who bring us the, um, uh, the, the PR in the digital age. So he's bring out the PR function has changed a lot seen in the digital age. Uh, it's going to bring up the mutual benefits between the organization and the public city. Uh, by the mean that uh, it will help to, to raise up the ethnic contact and mutual respect, understanding and collaboration. So it means as uh, PR and any PR practitioner need to be well educated and we, we do not know need to go the gatekeeper. The PR involved and change so much uh, and our role need to utilize available so, uh, social media to stay, keep update and complexity. 
during to the first panel is the high use of social in Turkey and in other region. So we can think that the just is social media is high level. Story is very important, but play very important role for any organization and prints. And don't forget that audio and visual quality also is very important for any PR and communication activities. For the second uh, keynote speaker from Mr. Nguyen Khoa Mi from the representative of PNPR, just is critical to our society at own level. And uh, he also bring us the standard transparency model. And remember that the truth is also very uh, complicated and a hard definition to define. Uh, to the second panel, uh, we can also see the culture is very important. So we need, as a peer practitioner, we need to understand the cultural differences between each area of our region. Using the empathy and tolerance attitude to understand and to make it uh, like more connected for the culture. And linguistic, cultural, recognition, the differences and the cultural sensitivity are the very key factors that we need to, to understand and to avoid the cultural aspect. So as uh, so, those are some of the very highlight and the main point which I have got up and consolidate from the two keynote speaker and for the two panels. And uh, once again, on behalf of WCFA, we would like to thank you everyone who joined the summit tonight, this morning, this afternoon, and we are looking forward for another summit in the very near future. Thank you. Thank you, May. Um, for the sake of time, uh, I think we can conclude at this point and we hope we can have another panel where we can have more discussion based uh, meeting for every voice to be heard and for every point to be answered. Thank you all for this rich meeting. And I always wish that we're gonna have one more forum of that at sure, least okay. soon. Thank you. Thank you very much and have a good Thanks, evening, everyone. morning, Thanks, afternoon, you. whatever, we love you. <laughs> We love you. Thank love you. you too. Bye -bye. Thank you, Mina, for, for engineering this. And Mina. <laughs> Thank you. Bye.